Games Workshop Warhammer 40k Pariah Nexus Sergeant Ulceus fired his bolt rifle one-handed, hauling a slack-limbed Imperial Guardsman to his feet and thrusting him towards his comrades. They took the soldier with fearful eyes, dragging him away from the Imperial Fist's glowering gaze. Ulceus had not moved his feet in the past half-hour, except to occasionally refine his firing stance, or when a forward lunge had been necessary to decapitate a scuttling, blade-fingered Xenos horror. His battle brothers had remained as unwaveringly staunch as he. For all the Imperial Fist stoicism, however, the stark reality of the situation was inescapable. Each time they and their fellow Imperial soldiery cut down a wave of trudging android fiends, another emerged from the firelit smog of the battlefield to take its place. The Necrons came on in shambling lockstep, firelight and muzzle flare lit the hollows of their skull-like visages. Energy weapons flashed in their grip as they advanced, laying low human warriors who, unlike the Xenos, could not be replaced. Yoseus shouted again, increasing the volume of his vox grill to a booming roar. Astra Militarum soldiers, fall back to the third embrasure! To their credit, the ragged formations of Imperial Guardsmen followed Yoseus' orders with alacrity. As he retreated, so the Imperial Fists stood their ground amidst the Cyclopean blocks of a destroyed curtain wall and kept firing. Dozens of Necrons advanced on them through the smoke and fumes of the battlefield, their bodies and eyes alike giving off an eerie glow that made them easy to spot. More groups of Imperial Guardsmen flooded between Yoseus and his battle brothers. Some fell screaming, hit from behind by gorse weaponry, their armor, flesh and bone disintegrating. Others stumbled, or even crawled, eyes glassy, movements becoming ever slower until they simply collapsed or stood vacant and unmoving in the midst of the battlefield. Yoseus had seen the same symptoms in countless human soldiers over the past weeks of battle. The stilling had claimed these poor wretches. The Necrons, he noted, simply passed them by, as though they no longer recognized them as living foes, he thought. Or perhaps they were a return for such unresisting victims once those who still fight are destroyed. There were others holding this line against the seemingly endless ranks of Necrons marching over the horizon. Battle sisters of the Order of Our Martyred Lady shouted their prayers to the Emperor. A single noble knight of House Griffith stood in the distance, astride the remnants of an outer forge shrine manned, Ulysses knew, by the remains of a Skitarii cohort. There had been others, many others, defending Mesonor, but their numbers had dwindled over days of grueling battle, as either the Necron's nightmarish weapons or the smothering shroud of the Nephilim anomaly claimed them. Such wider concerns were irrelevant to Ulysses' current mission, however. The Imperial Guardsmen appeared to suffer the effects of the anomaly to a greater degree than the other mortals. Thus, their protection and their deployment to defense lines, where their efforts would still have some efficacy, was his duty at this moment. He knew he needed to secure their retreat from the second embrasure to ensure that the third embrasure had soldiers to defend it while the Imperial Fist held their ground and dammed the tide of alien androids. A scratchy Vox message reached him, indecipherable. It was not just the Imperial Guardsmen that appeared to be hollowed out or worn thin by the Nephilim anomaly. Many mechanisms were too, as if their very machine spirits flagged as badly as the loyal Imperial warriors who relied upon them for their soccer. Repeat, he spat into the Vox link, even as he adjusted his aim and raked another Necron with bolt shells. The android's glowing body blew apart and its fragments began to fade from sight. Laid Company Fortis, request positions, a third embrasure corridor. The reply was barely audible but the reverberant tones and authority of a space marine's voice gave the demand for information around Timber, distinct to one of Dawn's sons. This was the Black Templar's Virgulf. He had been reported dead three times already. What is your status, Brother Virgulf? asked Yulseth. 
Waspik shows that your command have moved once more from your allotted positions. Confirm? The Black Templar did not respond, but the runes indicating his and his brattle brother's positions continued to move deeper into the Necron's ranks. It was not the first time the Black Templar zeal had overmastered their discipline. To Yulseus, it seemed as though, even as the Nephilim anomaly had withered the souls of the Astromilitarum soldiery, so it appeared to have paired the Black Templars back until they operated upon fanaticism. He wondered what it was doing to him, then discarded the notion as irrelevant. They would fight on. They would defend Mesonor from the Necrons until relief reached them or death brought an end to duty. There was nothing else. Brother Sergeant, the last of the Imperial Guardsmen have redeployed to Embracia Three, reported Brother Lysordia. Wilsaeus nodded acknowledgement, fired off another volley, and amplified his vox grill once more. Warriors of the Adeptus Sororitas, fall back to Third Embracia. The battle sisters complied, backing up in significant better order than the Imperial Guard had. Their bolters sang a thunderous hymnal of destruction as they went. Ulseus thought briefly of Virgulf, somewhere out there amidst the advancing foe, his spirit worn down to his hardened core of instincts. With some conscious ease, Ulseus loaded another magazine of bolt shells into his rifle. He braced again. His feet didn't move. The Zone of Silence It was a sprawling region of space from which no communication came, a zone of silence so complete as to eventually draw the strategic attention of the Ultramarine's Primarch, Rebute Gilliman, from half a galaxy away. To the Imperial forces sent to investigate its haunted depths, it was known first as a Nephilim Anomaly, and then as a Pariah Nexus. No one in the Imperium's highest echelons, not even the Lord Commander, with his statistical and organizational genius, had any inkling at first that the Nephilim Anomaly was but one among many pariah nexuses. At the dawn of the era Indomitus, after the spiritual darkness of the Noctis Eterna lifted, psychic distress calls bombarded terror from every corner of the Imperium. These mingled with the foul oratory of traitorous demagogues and alien warlords and the wailing of billions of damned souls. The cacophony was overwhelming, those rare regions of space that remained utterly silent stood out as stark mysteries, and none more profound or sinister than the void of psychic silence that was the Nephilim Sector. The grinding bureaucracy of the Indomitus Crusade's hierarchy rumbled into action. The Primarch appointed a battle group of Fleet Primus to discover the fate of the Sector's silent systems, and Battle Group Calides began its long journey from its mustering grounds. In its commander, Group Master Marin, Gilliman had selected a level-headed and proven naval officer. Fiercely pious and immovable on a decision once made, Marin proudly took up his role as the Lord Commander's torchbearer and the champion of Fleet Primus's vanguard into the region. Before the combined warships of Battle Group Calides even reached the system's border, the Nephilim Sector, Maran's outriders reported panic and terror spreading through these worlds like wildfire. Planets were in open revolt, roused by doomsayers who claimed that an onrushing malefic phenomenon would soon consume them. Populations were attempting to flee their planets en masse. Astropathic signals revealed heretic and Xenos raiders fighting fierce wars with Imperial forces from the Forboria stars to linchpin locations like the Zabrin system. In many cases, they seemingly fought not to seize worlds, but instead to harvest resources with which to fuel their own flight from whatever terrible power had been unleashed upon the stars in this region. Marin would not be distracted from the mission entrusted to him by the Primarch, but he dispatched task forces to restore Imperial rule in the worst affected systems. Marin's remaining strength entered the Nephilim subsector from the galactic northwest by the established warp channels. His ship's navigators spoke of perceiving a shimmering psychic veil as they approached the Zone of Silence. Against superstitious warnings of caution, Marang commanded the battle group to plow onwards. 
He had not come so far to be held back by talk of void spirits and ill fortune. What lay beyond the psychic veil, according to the sensitive amongst the ship's complements, was a stillness to the warp, terrifying in its totality. A Phantom Frontier The ship sped into task forces as they entered the Nephilim subsector, Maran pushing them towards the systems of Paradis, Zados, Shentai, and Vertigus. Navigators, astropaths, and seers wailed that they felt the cold hand of death clutching around their souls. War-hardened battle psychers complained they felt stilled, unable to reach for their powers, at times struggling even to draw their next panicked breath as they fought not to drown in thin air. Warp engines stuttered, requiring even more power to drive the ships through the immaterium. The task forces, crews, and armies began to suffer disquiet and tension. Executions for dereliction of duty or malcontent soared. When task forces finally translated back into real space on approach to their target systems, maneuvers the failing warp engines barely managed. There was still no sign of Imperial transmissions coming from worlds that Tithe records claimed were heavily settled. The feeling of a suffocating miasma only worsened as the first forces descended in dropships to the silent planets. Initial reconnaissance revealed ghost settlements emptied of citizens. When the task forces did eventually encounter the living, they sprawled like glassy-eyed and unresponsive dolls. Some overwhelming physical and spiritual lethargy had felled them, the same one that began to smother the task forces the longer they remained there. The baffled strategos of the battle group named the phenomena the stilling. Eventually, Evidence of any cause for the stilling was long to surface. Some empty cities and mining communes bore signs of violence. It was amid the partially settled jungles of Mesmok in the Zados system and later on other worlds that the source of the enervating scourge was discovered in the form of black stone pylons so tall they scraped the troposphere. The architects of the stilling and the crippling of the Nephilim sector finally revealed themselves when the battle group's forces first attacked the pylon of Mesmog. Armies of Necrons surged to attack in sudden and ferocious assaults across system-wide battlefronts. A stilled region. The first clash with the Necrons of the Nephilim subsector came in the shadow of the Mesmog pylon, but even before this, the task force of battle group Kaleides had gathered disturbing evidence as to the cause of the region's ominous silence. Vanished populations, abandoned high cities, and omnipresent spiritual suffocation proliferated. Marin and the battle group's commanders determinedly sought out the cause. Agriplexes, spaceports, generatorums, refineries, mining settlements, fortifications, even entire hives, all stood empty, or else were peopled only by scattered drifts of the stilled. Imperial forces found food cold and mouldering at tables, as though abandoned mid-meal. Servitors stood dead-eyed and silent, their machinery still operating, but their living components seized. Ground cars, mining rigs, and shuttles lay where they had crashed, as though their pilots had lost control, but done nothing to prevent collision. In places, much damage had been done by fires raging out of control or unattended plasma generators overloading. Nor was it only human life that appeared to be affected. Treading through verdant undergrowth on Calipor, Imperial Guardsmen gagged as they realized the soft give and crunch beneath their boots was not loamy earth, but the bodies of countless small animals that lay in catatonic stupor. The stultifying miasma affected the warriors of the Kalides task forces without exception. Soldiers complained of feeling watched only to succumb hours or days later to growing lethargy and exhaustion. Some would stumble to a halt mid-march, stand slack-jawed and unresponsive. Where they were not executed for dereliction of duty, these pathetic wretches were dragged aboard evacuation shuttles for attempted treatment or experimentation, depending on which of Marin's commanders reached them first. But precious few regained any semblance of awareness. Not even the Adeptus Astartes, the Scions of the Night Houses, or the Servants of the Omnissiah were unaffected by the stilling. 
They were more resilient, but not altogether immune. Only the battle group's Adeptus Sororitas appeared largely untouched. When the towering pylon was discovered on Mesmok by ultramarines of the battle group, it was soon clear to them that the noxious and smothering effect plaguing Khalidi's warriors was emanating from the ominous structure itself. The closer they got, the more intense was their unease. Galvanized by the thought of at least having a definite target, Moran capitalized on Ultramarine's strategic intelligence and organized a large assault upon the site. Reaching Mesmok proved incredibly dangerous in itself. Warp drive failures, as well as madness and suicide amongst his ship's astropaths, caused his assault forces to arrive piecemeal, where they arrived at all, for some were mired in distant systems or deep space, unable to perform warp translations. Those forces that reached the surface faced legions of necrons that marched from structures surrounding the pylon's base. Orbital bombardment from the battle group's powerful warships was deflected by the pylon's tremendously powerful quantum shielding. While a strike force of the Adeptus Astartes pushed forward to attack Necron ground forces around the pylon's base, their supporting forces of Imperial Guardsmen suffered terribly from the pylon's waves of enervating force. More losing heart or collapsing glassy-eyed by the moment. The battle for Mesmok ended in failure. Only the Space Marine's fighting retreat and punishing rear guard action preventing it turning into a rout and enabling at least some of the assault force to make it to the evacuating landers. The discovery of the pylon on Mesmok was joined by others. Each one was unique, though all towered to vertiginous heights. Some appeared embedded in solid rock, though whether built there, landed from orbit, or grown from underground could never be concluded. Others were found in orbit around stars or the fringes of systems, even in deep space. Many were discovered by the battle group's most determined and experienced investigator, Lord Inquisitor Draxus. She led efforts to understand what had occurred in the Nephilim sector, commanding numerous small missions by specialists to hunt down more information on the Necron's plans, as well as any way in which to topple the seemingly invulnerable pylons. More defeats followed Mesmok for Khalidis' task forces. On worlds in the Paradis and V. Almus systems, the battle group's army suffered a string of punishing losses. There were costly victories too, including the so-called Death March of Paradis II and the raid by a small Ultramarine's force into the sanity-defying realm beneath a mining commune in the Verticus system. The greatest victory of the campaign's early period, one much needed for what Group Master Maran saw as failing morale, was led by Ephrael Stern, the Demonifuge. The uncovering of more of the Necron's pylons and their obvious effect on Imperial forces in their vicinity had cemented man's belief that they and the sinister Xenos were behind the region's blight. Yet Stern had selected a target that did not host such a structure. Instead, having been scouted by the battle group's reconnaissance ships as representing a major hub of transportation for the Necrons, the ice world of Cherist in the Lomor system harbored a trio of dolmen gates at its southern pole, surrounded by a Necron complex as large as a city. These served as a crucial circuit through which large Necron forces moved to bolster war fronts throughout the region. If the gates could be destroyed, it would choke off the Xenos reinforcements at a stroke. Commanded by Stern, two huge invasion cathedrals thundered down upon the frigid site, disgorging many hundreds of battle sisters of the orders of our martyred lady and the Bloody Rose. They were accompanied by a host of other dropships and assault barges as well as the dropkeeps of House Mortan. In the ferocious battle that followed, thousands of Imperial Guard infantry and companies of battle tanks followed stern into the icy polar storm. Despite the anomaly's smothering shroud in the freezing cold, every Astro Militarum soldier advanced to the sounds of the battle sisters' voices raised and shouted war hymns. They felt their own faith in the God Emperor swell like the fires of the braziers flaring amidst the battle sisters' ranks, and felt certain that with such holy warriors of the master of mankind at their head, they could win this day. 
Many hundreds fell to the ancient blades and esoteric energy weapons wielded by Necrons of the Nihilac dynasty that resisted them. It was not enough. Buoyed by their collective faith in the Emperor, and with the Demonifuge herself striking down the Nihilac Phaeron with blazing bolts of faith made manifest, the Necrons were pushed back, ground down and forced to phase away in retreat. The Xenos Dolmen gates were torn down in fiery conflagrations, and the beginning of the Kaladi's resurgence was born. Stern's victory on Cherist was a strategic turning point in more ways than one. The destruction of the Necrons Dolmen gates on that world reduced what had been the insurmountable advantage of the Xenos' mobility. It limited their capacity to pour additional forces into continuing battles in the systems to the galactic north of the region. In the Zydos system, the Andromedan Blades chapter were finally able to break the siege of Exalta on the planet Mesonor. While on Herthalas, in the Shentai system, the fall in Necron reinforcements allowed nine regiments of Kishari Light Yeomanry to break out of a cordon in which the Necrons threatened to annihilate them. More significantly, Stern's victory on Cherus appeared to prove the effectiveness of faith against the entropic effects of the Necron's artifice. This seeming revelation was seized upon by the pious of battlegroup Kalides, few more so than Group Master Marin himself. The decay that haunted so many of the Nephilim subsector could, they proclaimed, be put to the torch of belief. Unconfirmed rumors circulated of still soldiers rising again with gasps of relief when surrounded by warriors of sufficient faith. Be it the tech zealotry of the Adeptus Mechanicus or the fervor of the Imperial cult, the soldiers of battlegroup Kalides clung to their creed like shipwrecked mariners to spars of wood in a storm. What humanity, in its blinkered understanding, had not yet grasped was that the Nephilim anomaly was a single cog in a scheme whose size and import were beyond anything the Imperium could engineer. The cosmic mechanism was spread to encompass the entire galaxy, with its goal as nothing short of divorcing reality from the warp for all eternity. The work owed its grandeur and immortal timescales to some of the Necron's most ambitious minds, and its patron was no less than the Silent King himself. While the likes of Inquisitor Draxus attempted to piece together the Nephilim and Armani's nature, to her and the rest of battlegroup Kalides, it still defied rational explanation. To its architects, however, the Contra Immaterium Nodal Matrix, as they termed it, was an unparalleled work of cosmic engineering. To effect the realization of his vision, the Silent King had drawn together some of the greatest cryptics known amongst the Necron dynasties, even a number of the historically rebellious but incredibly gifted Technomandrites. These eldritch technologists possess skills as transpatial geniuses, cryptofractal numerarchs, plasmatic viziers, and other aptitudes as esoteric and grandiose as the lineage of the most high-born of nobles. To create the growing Nephilim anomaly, entire stellar systems have been translocated the orbits of their constituent bodies had been realigned to match insane fractal circuits. Planets had been dragged from their host systems across gulfs of space to circle synthetic singularities, or else cast aside as cosmic clutter where they impinged on ley lines of galactic power, consigned to wander the void as rogue planetoids. Linking each astromantic hub, Corridors of stellar nodal entanglements were woven across light years of space to create a web of negatively charged anti-empiric energies between the megastructures encircling the star of their Zendu system and the nodal positions of the Blackstone pylons. The arcane scientific mechanisms that underpin the Nephilim anomaly suffused the star systems with a pall that choked off connections to the warp. Nor was it the only construct Crimtex in service of the Silent King had established other contra-empiric matrices around the remotest fringes of the galaxy to encircle it like a noose. These prior nexuses were the means by which the Silent King hoped to imperiously sunder the corruptive influence of the warp from the entire galaxy once and for all. With its malignancy isolated from real space, 
The Necrons would be free to harvest the soulless husks that remained of the galaxy's other species. Through them, perhaps, a way might be found to undo the curse of biotransference, to usher in a new time of flesh. The Silent King's galactic endeavor could never have succeeded without the armies of many of the Necron dynasties. The structures within each nexus could be threatened by the younger species before they were fully operational, and so the Silent King had leveraged the loyalty and ambition of countless lords and pharaons to his cause. He used their legions to protect his Blackstone pylons and crush attempts to both escape the growing Silent Realms or to invade them. Using Dolum Gates, Cesarek kept a close watch on his nodal matrices around the galaxy's edge, often hiding his presence from his servants and enemies both. It was in the Nephilim sector, however, that the Silent King strode forth from his war bark, the Song of Oblivion, to lead his followers, seeing his great work threatened by the rising tide of foes there. Some dynasties, including those of the Cesarekan, provided legions and service to the Silent King out of absolute loyalty to him. Others bent the knee out of fear of the Triarch Praetorians, or voiced their support only in return for guarantees of great wealth, territory, and harvests of stilled specimens in the Nexus regions. Despite his political mastery, the Silent King's offers and threats were rebuffed by some pharaons, none more so than the Sautek. Though they led to strident claims of the God Emperor's renewed favor, Battlegroup Kalidis' seemingly miraculous victories could not eclipse their more numerous defeats. Several task forces were lost entirely to Necron offenses, to the effects of the Entropic Shroud, or simply vanished without explanation. Group Master Marin was compelled to pull his remaining forces back to a narrow interstellar frontage, focusing on systems where several task forces could be brought to bear at once. Worse, he was stripped of the grim wisdom of Inquisitor Draxus. With her expanded retinue and assets requisitioned from Marin's dwindling forces, the Lord Inquisitor had vanished on a mission of her own. Few among the Imperial forces would have understood this significance, even had they known that the Silent King had come to lead the Necrons in person. Yet his presence was swiftly felt by Group Master Marin's strategos, Imperial battlefronts that had been stabilized through blood and zeal shuddered close to collapse under renewed Necron offenses. Ghastly new weapons were unleashed by the android aliens, to whose cosmic power Maran's followers had no answer. Battlegroup Kalides was on the brink of annihilation when tentative contact was made with a struggling flotilla of Imperial warships entering the Nephilim subsector. Here at last, where the task forces of Moran had detached to stabilize the systems beyond the anomaly's boundaries. They rejoined their battle group in the very nick of time. With them came reinforcements from battle group Orpheus of Fleet Primus, including missions of the Order of the Bloody Rose and Skitarii cohorts from Mars, Imperial-aligned night houses, and hundreds of regiments of the Astra Militarum. At a stroke, the Imperial forces of the Nephilim subsector had doubled, yet in the face of Necron attacks increasing in size and frequency and the undimmed horror of the region's choking aura, those who had lost heart saw only the dragging out of an unavoidable and horrible fate. Moran and his commanders reorganized their task forces, integrating the reinforcements into their revised battle plans, when they could reach them, that is, for some were scattered or stalled after breaching the ghostly veil. Limited Vox, with messages often carried via desperate short-range warp jumps and passed between a series of hastily deployed messenger fleets, hampered the task forces of Kalides and Orpheus. The few hardy astropaths who remained to the combined fleets could not force more than the briefest of messages through the anti-empiric PAL, and with no guarantee even those would reach the wider Imperium. The least insane navigators all told their captains the region's boundaries were becoming harder to detect, as it spread further and seemingly in every direction. Many of Maran's commanders advised a withdrawal to a less benighted region, from where a request for aid to stem the Necron threat could be dispatched. Pious and stubborn, Groupmaster Maran refused. The very notion of retreat disgusted him. 
It was epistolary Sengrest of the Imperial Fist who conceived of a conclave, one which would compromise the strongest available battle psychers, seers and astropaths, and that would force a distress call out through the shroud of the Nephilim anomaly without the need for retreat. These psychers gathered on the ice world of Cherist in the Lomor system, still scarred and bloody with the victory that had been won there. Cherist had come to be seen as hallowed in imperial faith and sanctified in the sight of the Emperor. On Cherist, the effect of the stilling appeared somewhat reduced. The phenomenon was attributed by minister and priests to the fierce faith of the conquering battle sisters and subsequent bolstering of the unceasing prayers and offerings of many thousands of frost-bitten martial congregations. With Cheris polar dolmen gates smashed, the hope was also that Necron attempts to retake the Lomor system would be stymied. What Thengrest and his conclave needed was time in which to pool their psychic might and punch a warning through the Nexus. To this end, Lieutenant Stornvor of the Imperial Fists and Marshal Arnulf of the Black Templars lent an interstellar counteroffensive across a broad front to drive the wider Necron forces back from the Lomor system. Stornvor envisioned the Nephilim subsector as a single fortress, vast in scope, but currently overrun by an invading Xenos occupier. Those planetary systems presently held by Imperial forces were considered as secure, if often besieged, strong points. War fronts akin to fortress walls were then drawn between them, some currently in Imperial hands, while others were considered breached. With this simple and robust strategic picture established, three strike forces of Arnos Black Templars, reinforced with the most aggressive or zealous Imperial troops available, launched a system-by-system counterattack out from the heart of the fortress. They drove like a sallying force out from the fortress's gates and scattered the Necrons as they advanced impetuously towards the region some strategists believed was the heart of the Nephilim anomaly. Behind them came Lieutenant Stormvor's armies. Around a backbone of Imperial Fist forces, he mustered huge defensive garrisons of Astra Militarum, Adeptus Sororitas, and Adeptus Mechanicus soldiery. Some of Stormvor's warriors bolstered the strong points of the fortress or retook breached walls. Others moved up to secure those systems of worlds purged by Arnos' crusading advance. They manned stations and docking facilities, hive cities and shrine plexes, quarries and frontier settlements. Stormvor's siege artisans raised additional defenses wherever possible, while in the void further protective measures were put in place. Fields of orbital mines defense monitors and reawakened orbital stations, webs of hidden auger platforms and clusters of semi-automated torpedoes all hung ready. Monitored by the swiftest frigates of the messenger fleet, it was hoped that these defenses would also provide some early warning of Necrons trying to circumvent the fortified systems. As the counter-offensive led by the space marines drove ever outwards, so the psychic conclave on Cherist completed their mighty ritual. A blaze of empiric force leapt from the world, a strident intermingling of warning clarion and cry for aid hurled like an immaterial spear towards the heartlands of the Imperium Sanctus. This apparent success was not one without cost. Many psychers died from the strain of forcing the warning through the veil, and then it was over. The smothering shroud closing in around Cherist once more. None amongst the Imperial forces would know if their efforts had been worth it until aid arrived, if it did. The March of Death Marshal Arnold's spearheads secured many victories, the speed and zeal of their onslaught allowing them to maintain momentum. Their forward motion lessened only once several Necron dynasties deployed massive blocking forces in the path of the Imperial advance. Seeking to mire Arnulf's armies in sprawling attritional conflicts, at Tredica, Ig and Gornal Illuminata, the Xenos strategy was only confounded thanks to Imperial reinforcements by Stormvor's reserve forces. The fervor of Marshal Arnulf's assault forces was beyond doubt, yet the long delays that they had to endure pushed the sanity of the more zealous warriors to their limits with the ever-present effect of the prior nexus wearing at the edges of their consciousness. Each grinding battle left the space marines perilously low on ammunition, fuel cells, and energy coils. 
They preserved what they could by resorting to crushing their foes beneath their armored fists and feet whenever possible. Letting their genetically augmented strength, the whining talk of their armor servos, and their hatred of the Xenos drive their blows. The assault forces resupply fleets, strain to successfully make one short warp jump after another, steadily falling behind the nearer the assault forces approached the Nexus's center. More than one supply ship had to be abandoned in the interstellar void, as warp engines or Geller field generators were burned out in attempts to force a warp translation. The ship's real space engines, capable only of in-system travel, were simply unable to move the ships the huge distance to the nearest system before the crew themselves had long since rotted away. Despite all the efforts of the Adeptus Astartes and their supporting forces, the commanders of battle group Kalides and Orpheus could not escape the stark reality of their situation. Their counter-offensives were blunting themselves against resurgent Necron attack waves across a half-dozen systems. A number of the bastions and defense lines secured in the initial flush of Lieutenant Stormforce successes were now perilously close to collapse once again. On hololithic deuses and illuminated cartographic lecterns, Necron fleets and armies advanced on entrenched Imperial positions city by city, planet by planet, and system by system, like rot creeping through flesh that had already died. Despite the dedication of the battlegroup's messenger ships and their crews, Imperial strategy could not keep up with the speed of many Necron forces, nor ever claim to have identified them all. Demands for support or information were repeatedly dispatched to garrisons that had long since been eradicated. Whimpered claims of attacking Necrons received from fortified outposts were dismissed by logisticians, sure that there were no Xenos there at all. Many such reports were dismissed as delusions brought on by the stilling. The Necrons' steady gains, as they forced Imperial armies to cede ground or else annihilate them, could have been even swifter and more methodically efficient, but for the actions of a few nobles. The dynastic forces fighting in support of the Silent King were not the only Necrons operating in the region. Some Necron warlords raided human ships or worlds with no thought for the Silent King's wider strategy. Trains in the Infinite, after alerting an Imperial fleet to a hidden Necron presence at Alice Nebula, was accused of raiding numerous other Necron and alien ships, stations and vaults, stirring up a confused hornet's nest across six entire systems. Feron Vodreska, last scion of the Fatanet dynasty, appeared to have suddenly vanished, leaving her subordinate Necron lords isolated and vulnerable. Word also reached the Silent King of Necron forces directly attacking his loyal servants, and even laying siege to nodal systems on the galactic eastern edge of the nodal matrix. He dispatched Overlord Neshkafar of the Sharakan dynasty to discover who these treacherous armies served. If it was not a noble bent upon selfish personal conquest, or suffering some manner of post-hibernatory madness, then perhaps those technomandrites he had been unable to sway to his cause had at last found allies. The bastion of Imperial resistance that Maran, Sternvor, Arnulf and others had built was breached many times. Like barricaded barbicans in a compromised fortress, some of the Imperial forces' defense emplacements managed to hold as they had been intended. These were the ones that had time to become fully entrenched, with reserves of resources to endure extended seizures. On the mineral-rich worlds in the Argovon system, aboard Laboratorm stations orbiting the neon-lit gas giants of Zeta-8 Hypspus and at the mining communes of the Verticus system, Imperial defenders held back increasing numbers of Necrons deployed from immense tomb ships. A small Necron force of the Sharakan dynasty managed to reach the heavily fortified Lomor system. Its ships assumed to have slipped between the layers of watching Imperial picket squadrons. This assault too was repulsed, but none amongst Marin's commanders doubted that far stronger Xenos fleets could yet bludgeon their way through the system's outer sentinels. The inconsistency of the Necron fight back enabled pockets of Imperial defenders to survive where they might otherwise have been crushed. Some held world cities or even lone fortresses, surviving in the midst of a grinding Necron onslaught that had crushed their outer defenses and stalwart armies into kernels of resistance. 
Other holdouts anchored networks of fortifications, orbital batteries and fleets of warships, spread across surviving planetary systems and retaining vital strongpoints within the wider fortress envisioned by Arnulf and Stormvor's plan. The Mertika system had been such a strategic holdfast, yet it was amongst those whose defenders had been routed by the Necron advance. The aviponic nutrient grav networks, a wonder of the sky farms of Hankin's world, they smashed in a blanket of burning mechanisms half a mile thick. The sunken arcologies on Zoran had been cored through with energies that had vitrified the subterranean habs. Eerie and spindled corpse shapes in their billions melted into their surface. The quarry worlds of Vergois Alphic and Vergois Gamal, their industrial and trade sites once thronged with labor forces in the hundreds of thousands, now echoed only with wind that whipped firestorms across the depopulated shells of Factorum cities. Only on the rad-scoured moon known as Mertika's Colic did an isolated garrison hold out. Unable to detect any Imperial signals for all the few thousand Space Marines, Battle Sisters and Imperial Guardsmen knew, they were the last defenders of the subsector. Obsessed with extinguishing this last holdout, destroyers, flayed ones, and other nigh uncontrollable Necrons or Mortika's colic had been left there when the primary dynastic forces had moved on to hunt down more numerous human threats. Steadfastly aloof from the Necrons' nobility, who supported the Silent King for all manner of obsequious or unhanded political agendas, Oricon the Diviner considered his own motives for coming to the Nephilim subsector more important and far-reaching. The former chief astrologer of the Silent King's court had experienced a series of ominous tragedies. Several of his most recent prophecies had suffered spectacular failures. His divinations had been twisted. Fated moments turned out of alignment, not just subtly, but with gross divergences from timelines he had carefully manipulated. Oricon's attempt to mitigate these disasters, traveling back and forth along his own history to hide his failings from other Necrons, revealed to him a tantalizing corruption. The Chronomancer came to the conviction that some inconceivably vast release of fundamental energies had ripped through the weft of his prophecies. The temporospatial origins of the Calamity were obscured by casual storms of remarkable ferocity but Oricon was a master of his craft. He followed the strands of broken prognostication in a trail that ultimately led him to the Nephilim subsector. Here, he knew, was a focal region of the Silent King's nodal matrix. What loyalty Oricon had once felt to the ruler of the Necrons had disintegrated long ago, but the Diviner still respected the Silent King's attempt to cleanse the galaxy of the warp's taint. Oricon was by now convinced that a singular event was coming that would corrupt the machineries of fate and quite possibly imperil the nodal matrix in its entirety. It was this threat that he set himself against, hunting with ever greater urgency for the war-torn systems of the Nephilim anomaly for clues as to what singular event could so fundamentally ruin his masterful calculations. As the war within the Pariah Nexus turned once more against the Imperial armies, many prayed for a miracle of deliverance they struggled to believe would manifest. Invasions, rebellions, and insurrections blighted the rest of the Imperium Sanctus and the armies of the Indomitus Crusade, as huge and numerous as they were, were spread thin across countless war zones. The desperate psychic message thrust out from Celest, however, had managed to punch through the anomalies out of veil. After an agonizingly slow trek, passed and shunted through one astropathic relay after the next, it eventually reached Reboot Gilliman, where he coordinated the campaign of Fleet Primus. With his towering intellect and capacity for strategic insight, the Lord Commander of the Imperium recognized the threat represented by the developing situation in the Nephilim anomaly. He had not fully understood its workings or ultimate goal, but he did not need to in order to stamp it out. The Primarch diverted a fraction of his attention to focus on the Nephilim sector. What appeared to be happening there, both the insidious techno-spiritual threat and the mobilization of such vast and coordinated Necron legions demanded his personal intervention. There were urgent logistical matters he had to handle first, 
matters on which billions of lives and entire campaigns hung. Thus, unable to set out immediately in person, Galliman instead mustered a response force and sent it ahead of him to stabilize the situation in the Nephilim sector. Battlegroup Hephaestus of Indomitus Fleet Primus formed its foundation, commanded by Groupmaster Vicrian. The battlegroup's strength was hugely augmented by a mighty contingent drawn from the ranks of the Adeptus Mechanicus and led by Archmagos Belisarius Call himself. Gulliman reasoned that if any of his lieutenants could comprehend the true technological threat developing in that war zone, it would be he. The response fleet's mission was to exploit the information gleaned from the cherished message and employ every effort and strategy available in an attempt to counter the spreading Xenos nodal network. It would further be the duty of Kor's force to relocate the surviving elements of battlegroup Kalides and Orpheus to provide them with whatever reinforcements was possible and to once again solidify the battle lines they had drawn up. In this way, a true bridgehead into the Nephilim anomaly could be secured. When Gilliman himself arrived with further reinforcements, the hope was that however dire the survivors had claimed the Xenos threat to be, the combined Imperial armies would be enough to drive them back. Whatever peril was represented by the expanding zone of silence, Gulliman would see it eliminated entirely. Yet before he could do so, it would fall to Belisarius' core to construct the foundations for the Primarch's onslaught. It was a mission the Archmagos was only too eager to undertake. After all, a region so rich in Noctilith deposits and abandoned technologies might prove as profitable to secure as it was strategically vital. Dam Sorrel Volker piloted her night warden, Diodamus, along the narrow roadway. Sarclaw Volker followed in his night paladin, Omtola. The two knights forced into single file by the close confines of the Angelus Alphic prehab belt. Ruined buildings seemed to press in upon them from either side, looming dark and cadaverous from the whirling snowstorm that reduced visibility to a dozen yards at best. Dam Sorrow kept a portion of her attention on her tactical auspicator, knowing it would be the only warning she would get if the Necrons located them. She despised the notion of creeping through these ruins, hoping the storm would stave off the enemy. But then, she thought, this was the war on Cherist now. Quickly shaking off the distraction, Sorrow fought for focus. Not for the first time, she silently cursed the fog clouding her thoughts and the numb tingle in her extremities. She could not afford to let the anomaly enfold her. Too many of the Omnissiah's faithful had fallen that way. She focused through her external vid feeds, keeping a wary eye upon the snow-covered roadway ahead. Amidst the prehabs, one had almost to watch for wrecked armored transports, frozen corpse piles, or toppled rubble hidden beneath the snow. One wrong footfall on such ground, and her night suit might be pitched into a fall from which it could not be recovered. Sorrow felt disloyal to her steed for thinking it, but the truth was that Diodamus's machine spirit was suffering as badly as she was, and so she could no longer entirely trust that the knight's own sensors would detect such a hazard before it would trip them. On her tactical manifold, Sorrow saw Omtola's rune flash amber before stuttering back to Jade. A glance through her rearward feed showed a shattered spar of masonry, falling from where Claw's nightsuit had slipped it with a weapon limb. The lapse reminded Sorrow that she and her steed were not alone in suffering under their anomaly shroud. Machine God, take this cadaverous slum, muttered Claw over the vox. Endure, cousin, replied Sorrow. Our patrol is almost at an end. Outpost Gehenos lies but four miles to our west, Marching this route shields us from the attention of the foe. Hopefully, she added silently to herself, her gaze darting across the external vid feeds at the ruins and the white whirling maelstrom around her. This honorless sinking sits ill with Omtola, replied Claw, seeming set on querulousness, quite out of character with his usual stoicism. Another symptom of the stilling that had worsened in recent days. Soros knew it yet her own mental reserves were fraying too, and she could not stop herself from scowling behind her gilded face mask. 
Cousin, you know as well as I it is necessary, she said, more sharply than she intended. Had we the supplies of ammunition and fuel to support direct conflict, and enough sacristans still conscious to tend our steeds, I would be the first to lead the charge against these Xenos filth. That way at least lies glory, Claw shot back in frustration. A final charge for chivalry and the Omnissiah. Better than rusting away in obsolescent hope until they pick us apart like carrion feeders on a carcass. Madame Sorrow heard the whispers of the geis of her throne. Some counseled faith, hope and endurance. Others, a growing minority these days, echoed Claw's own sentiments. Diodamus's reactor gave a restive rumble that she felt as a tremor through her throne. Not you too, she muttered. Did they think she felt differently about matters? Was she the only one with the self-restraint to see that they were being tested and could not simply succumb? Cousin, we must have faith, she said after a calming breath. The Messiah would not abandon us to such an ignominious fate. We, the livid green flare of gorse fire came so suddenly that it dragged a gasp from Dam Sorrow, cutting her off mid-sentence. Her external vid feeds blazed emerald. Through the glare, she saw deflagrated energies rake Omtola's right shoulder guard and scour away the last remnants of its proud heraldry. Flayed layers of adamantine and plasteel billowed into particulate clouds to be whipped away by the screaming winds. The night paladin lurched sideways, its bulk toppling a burned-out barrack block. Over the vox, Sorrow heard her cousin's pained cursing as he fought to turn his steed and angle his iron shield towards the threat. The blast was followed by another from the opposite side of the roadway, yet that first shot had been all the warning a veteran like Dam Sorrow needed. Even in her mentally degraded state, instinct, saw her tilt her own steed's iron shield deftly and absorb the force of the gorse blast in a flash of emerald on turquoise. Diadamus's stuttering auspicator chimed a belated warning as it painted multiple targeting runes across her external viewfield. Sorrow's fingers twitched in a haptic dance as she cogitated targeting solutions and threat vectors. There were at least a score of contacts to the south of the roadway and an undefined number to the north. Data readout suggested anti-grav assets amongst them, but the whirling snowstorm made visual recognition impossible. Sorrow was hunting by energy spore alone. Cousin, she barked through the vox. We live, replied Sarclaw, voice tight with psychosemantic pain. They will not. Dam Sorrow triggered her weapons the moment Diodamus acquired positive lock. With an effort, she restrained her salvo to conserve ammunition. Her night suit's Avenger Gatling cannon screamed briefly as it spat hail of shells into the white haze. Two warheads leapt from its storm spear pod, a third of all Sorrow had left. Explosions flared dimly amidst the swirling snowfall. A slew of hostile runes vanished from her auspex. Sarclaw's response was less measured. He was angry, Sorrow suspected. His pride stung by having been caught unawares. Sorrow heard faintly the thumping of Omtola's battle cannon as it placed a full spread of shells into the ruins north of the roadway. Reprimands about ammo conservation could come later. For now, Sora's blood was up, and she couldn't help a snarl of satisfaction as her cousin's fire eradicated more of her foe. The charred remains of an armored bastion collapsed amidst the blossoming explosions, burying yet more Xenos attackers, even as they stalked into view. Reading something heavy moving three points south, Vox Claw. Sorrow checked her auspex. She saw nothing. Come on, old friend she muttered to Diodamus. Strive for accuity and be swift if you can. A geist return flickered on the screen as it powered up. Whatever it was, the target was moving rapidly towards her. Dam Sorrow sent haptic commands racing through her throne mechanicum, compelling Diodamus to adjust stance, bring its weaponry to bear, and re-angle its ion shield. An instant later, another stream of gorse fire erupted from the snow and hammered Diodamus's defenses. Not one blast, Sorrow realized, but three. The first she caught on her shield, the second went wide. The third gouged Diadamus's torso armor like a sword cut to the ribs. Sympathetic pain exploded through Sorus's side and she convulsed, 
subconsciously making Diodamus take a step back. Three armored shapes erupted from the screening snow, metallic humanoids with heavy cannons in place of arms, and grotesque insectar grav sleds where Saurus's brain insisted their legs should be. She recognized the locust heavy destroyers, even as they attempted to skim past her knight and then flank her shield. Although she was wounded and, if she were honest with herself, likely halfway to being stilled, Damsaurus's fury was enough to propel her into action. She swung her avenger to bear and raked one of the grav-skimming android artillery warriors into scattering shrapnel. The second she swatted from the air with a skillful backhand swipe of Diadamus's Thunderstrike gauntlet, the blow smashed the lockhurst into a flank of a hab block and left it embedded, a sparking ruin that slowly faded from sight in a haze of green energy. The third heavy destroyer weaved past her, and Sorrow felt at moments impotent rage as the android slewed around in mid-air to reveal its cannon at her knight's undefended flank. The Necron never fired. Omtola's reaper chainsword came down upon it like the Omnissiah's own judgment and clove the Lockhurst in half. Its wreckage lay twitching in the snow, the heat of its demise raising obscuring clouds of steam. Damn Sorrow allowed herself a long, slow breath. Orspex told her that had been the last of the ambushers. Thank you, cousin, she said. You were right, he replied simply. We endure. The Omnissiah expects no less. Let us complete our sweep. As they set off again into the snowy ruins, Sorrow nodded to herself. They would endure. They could not give in. And soon, Omnissiah willing, they would be relieved. The Noctilith Acquisition the advance of battle group Hephaestus into the Nephilim subsector was markedly different to that of Calides or Orpheus. Forewarned by the terrorist message, Belisarius' call and the battle group's tech priests had gone to extreme lengths to mitigate the dangers to their ship's warp engines and the prior Nexus's illogical effect on their navigators. The forces of battle group Hephaestus were predominantly drawn from the forge worlds of Mars and Metallica. Several other Forge Worlds had also provided cohorts and macroclades to Hephaestus, including Ross Prime, Riser, and Phaeton. Such are tens of thousands of the Machine Guard's faithful rode to war aboard the battle group's varied warships and forge barks. While Hephaestus also boasted Space Marine strike forces, as well as large complements of the Astra Militarum, the Adeptus Sororitas, and questing lances of Imperial Knights, the battle group's Adeptus Mechanicus leanings meant that many of its senior commanders were Tech Magi, who in turn answered to Archmagos Belisarius' call. During the passage to reach the Nephilim sector, following the same route as battle group Kalides, the Tech priests had bent their intellects to the matter of conquering the deleterious effects of the prior Nexus. Where Group Master Marin's officers and crews had pushed their ailing ships through the seemingly becalmed Immaterium, Pouring ever more energies into faltering warp engines, Battlegroup Hephaestus turned instead to a dizzying array of technological solutions. A few radical tech priests actively attempted experimental techniques, hiding their near-heretical tinkering with the warp engines of their vessels behind claims of extreme piety. Most, however, had brought ancient archaeotech from their forge world's deepest and most secure vault, Mechanisms are devices of terrible antiquity that the Magi believed would serve to ameliorate the perils of the Nephilim anomaly. Some of Hephaestus's tech priests wired sigil scribe cages of psychers into their ships as living batteries, attempting to emulate the conclave of Cherist by focusing empiric power into thrumming banks of capacitors. Others had installed congregations of lobotomized tech chorists into specialized forged shrines that amplified their binaric psalms. The arcane mechanisms deployed to push back the oppressive pool ranged in size from the fist-sized Arcanulus geode of Thryn to Dea Factura Magnificat, a forged complex as large as a sword-class frigate. None of these attempts were wholly successful. A few individual ships and even entire task forces managed to enter the subsector with only minimal damage to their warp engines and with their astropaths and navigators terrified, but relatively sane. As a whole, however, the cohesion of battlegroup Hephaestus 
began to degrade from the moment it passed through the fringes of the nodal matrix. Belisarius' call made every effort to enforce unity of purpose throughout his battle group and to keep them moving as one. Thanks to the varied efficacy, or even in some cases, the unexpected drawbacks of the Archaeotech devices deployed, however, this became ever more difficult. Nor was the task aided by the disparate agendas concealed by some of Kor's subordinates. The battle group's reinforcements were thus scattered from the start. But this was an eventuality the Archmagos had factored into his strategic algorithms, and one which was not wholly undesirable to him. In many ways, the fracturing mirrored the complex web of egos and motivations amongst the tech priests. Even those hailing from the same forge world were rivals to some degree. Split up in this way, Kor reasoned, there was less chance of confrontations on matters of technological dogma and less risk of progress being held up by those who harbored stubborn slithers of pride in their remaining flesh. Being spread across the galactic northwest of the subsector, the task force's vectors and velocities at odds with each other also increased the probability of their locating their battle group's objectives, the surviving defenders, and a solution to whatever the Necrons had unleashed upon the galaxy. Call believed he saw the solution clearly, and he had acted to prepare the tools he would need before battle group Hephaestus ever reached the Nephilim sector. Before beginning the battle group's plunge into the region, Call communicated what became known as the Noctilith Decree. Compressed into a fractal data packet that he speared into the consciousness of the battle group's tech priests, Quall proclaimed their objectives. Some of her Hephaestus' ships and armies would form Aegis fleets, reinforcing those Imperial forces that were found to have survived and fortifying those worlds that had fallen. Others would form accretion fleets to seek out and secure deposits of Noctilith wherever they could be found and to process them on a scale never before seen within the Imperium. As part of his data packet, Hall spread his directive for what to accomplish with the secured Blackstone. In his estimation of the Cheris message, the Necron pylons were being negatively charged. Such a process would unlock the full potential of the Noctilus to repel the energies of the warp, which, Hall hypothesized, went some way to explain how the zone of contra-immaterial silence was being maintained. The Archmagos commanded that the masters of his Cretan fleets would oversee the fashioning of their amassed blackstone into massive toroid constructions of Kor's own design, which he called liminal abrasers. These could be towed by grass tether behind their larger exploratory vessels and forge barges. Employing a radical series of technological adaptions of the warp engines of those vessels, Kor believed his magi could apply a carefully measured positive empiric charge to their liminal abrasers. These mechanisms were theorized to project and sustain a quantum-folded architecture of energy into the liminal zones between real space and the warp. This energistic field was an entangled irritant that neither realm of existence would allow to endure permanently, or so Kor claimed. The Archimagos believed that, once a positive empiric charge ran through their brazers at precisely the right modulation, the devices would compress and excite the energy fields they generated against the phantom veil the Necrons had erected. With the energinistic fields as lapping powders, the Archmagos explained, and the mechanisms acting as the grindstones, it would be as if the glorious Omnissiah himself worked to wear away the oppressive barrier of the Nephilim anomaly. No physical examples of a liminal abrasor existed. No tech priest of battle group Hephaestus had encountered such a rumor of such a technology. The Archimagos ignored demands to reveal where he had discovered the sacred design. The details he provided were also fragmentary and unutterably ancient, with hermetic signifiers and formulaic leaps that defied immediate understanding by the tech priests. Yet the awe they felt as they absorbed every facet of the information overrode almost all trepidation. It was cause hope that, with sufficient experimentation and processional refinement, the liminal abrasers could extend their effects to encompass entire worlds or even star systems, and thus drive back the insidious effects of the nodal matrix one bloody step at a time. 
The Archmago shared a fractal of his accumulated Blackstone lore with the Tech Magi of Battle Group have faced us, enough for them to grasp the rare material's pivotal role in his plans and to carry out his instructions for its use, but no more. Driven to experiment tirelessly in search of the solution, Call had ordered a huge reserve of Noctilis loaded into the holds of his vessel, Zarquesator, before setting out for the Nephilim sector. However, he knew that much more of the substance would be required for his plans. Fortunately, accumulated star charts and cribbed Munitorum report stacks concerning the Nephilim subsector suggested that the region boasted a large number of quarry worlds. The Archmagos didn't doubt that the Necrons would have plundered some of these worlds for their own dark artifice. He hoped, however, that enough reserves would remain to serve his accretion fleet's purposes. There was also the tantalizing possibility of using the Necrons' own works against them. Call held information besides the Cherus message, data that suggested that the Necrons' pylons were not invulnerable and that they could be brought down from within. If that were true, then their substance could be claimed for his own use and become part of the solution itself. Those task forces of battle group have faced us that would serve as the Aegis fleet were to be called Shield. Most comprised no less than a dozen warships of varying size, escorting at least one huge forge ship. Due to the scattering caused by the battle group's entry, however, some Aegis fleets had adopted new protocols or commanders due to ships or whole squadrons having been held back, driven off course or forced into emergency war translations that separated them from their assigned Aegis fleet. Most were led by senior adepts of the Omnissiah, high-ranking Magi, Tech Priest Dominus and Manipulus, as well as others who claimed polysyllabic titles of increasingly arcane and archaic meaning, who typically named their fleets after themselves. The Aegis fleets comprised significant numbers of war engines, long-ranged tech artillery, and large cohorts of battle servitors and Castellan robots, backed by the massed ranks of Skitarii soldiery. These forces were supplemented by the majority of battle group Hephaestus's non-Adeptus Mechanicus contingents. Hall had theorized that those without faith in the machine guard might question the necessity for harvesting or experimenting upon Noctilith, and might even hamper the efforts of the tech priests if they perceived such labors were slowing their martial advance. Worse, within his Noctilith decree, Call had authorized his lieutenants to ignore the pleas of beleaguered Imperial forces in favor of harvesting Blackstone. He reasoned after all that finding the eventual solution to the dangers of the anomaly mattered more than preserving armed forces already rendered combat ineffectual by long-term exposure to the stilling. He doubted, however, that the more bellicose or unaugmented amongst the battle group's commanders would agree with this assessment. Thus, Call had convinced Groupmaster Vicrian to distribute most of the battle group's Adeptus Astartes and Adeptus Sororitas, along with hundreds of Imperial Guard regiments throughout the Aegis fleet. His reasoning to Vicrian was that these fleets would be directly engaged in linking up with and reinforcing traumatized Imperial survivors who would integrate more readily with fellow humans or inspirational super soldiers than with the coldly inhuman servants of the Machine Guard. Privately, Call cogitated that Vicrian's non Adeptus Mechanicus soldiery could do the most good if not placed in direct positions where flesh and blood fallibilities might lead them to what he considered illogical action. They still operated under the nominal authority of Tech Magi, who had adopted the augmetics of their war forms and downloaded strategic protocols into their partitioned minds. These priests heeded the wisdom of experienced martial commanders within their fleets, but every decision was ultimately at the mercy of their own ruthless logic. The Aegis fleets were charged first and foremost with establishing fortified presences on Imperial worlds within the systems nearest to their subsector entry point in the galactic northwest. To this end, at least one ancient Manufactorum barge was present in each flotilla. These enormous mountains of industry churned out arsenals of weaponry, fabricated defense embrasures and bunker complexes, distilled chemical fuels 
and generated thermal and plasmatic energies in gargantuan volumes as the fleets moved towards their targets. Those separated, the Aegis fleet set about their duty with mechanical efficiency. Within days of the official commencement of operations, a half-dozen worlds had been secured by the task forces of Battlegroup of Phaestus and contact established with scattered elements of Sternvor's fortress. Such Imperial holdouts were alarmingly few, however, and all required some degree of immediate rescue from besieging Necron forces that pressed in upon them on the ground and in the void. In many other places, the Aegis fleets found only husks of empty devastation. Above Grimhale and Udin Pentus, both worlds encircled by the orbiting wrecks of destroyed transport barges and what had likely been escorting warships. On the planet's surfaces, huge tracks of destruction spoke of ferocious battles long since lost by the Imperial defenders. Rotting corpses and rusting tank shells were strewn throughout the blackened bones of cities. Inside sealed bunkers, the scouting forces of the Aegis fleet found groups of slumped warriors with glassy eyes, sinned by starvation despite the bunkers' ration supplies. Onto these fallen worlds, the Aegis fleets dropped sky-darkening flights of dropships and lander hulks. Clades of lobotomized servitors set to work erecting around armored bulwarks and bristling forge shrines. Industrial sites were repurposed as holy manufactura and shielded arsenals. Like bustling nests of insects, former cities, quarries, and fallen bastions were remolded by work gangs of servitors, swarms of servo skulls, anti grav lifters, and industrial pattern archaeopters. World by world, system by system, the martial artisans of the Adeptus Mechanicus and their many allies fashioned the beginnings of the foothold for reconquest. Archimagoth Call had correctly assessed that a percentage of the Tech Magi under his command were become distracted by their own agendas. Such is ever the way with the Adeptus Mechanicus, whose war leaders are as much holy scientists and dogmatic rivals as they are battlefield strategists. Some now exploited the relative isolation and enforced communication difficulties inflicted by the Nephilim anomaly as excuses to pursue their own experiments under battlefield conditions. Some of the Magi disagreed with Kor's planned use of Noctilith entirely. The fact that the Necrons employed the material made them uneasy to use it themselves. They abhorred the Necrons' android forms as a gross perversion of the machine god's holy ideal, and would not sully themselves or their followers by employing the mechanisms of their alien enemy. Instead, they sought only to crush the Necrons at any opportunity, rather than engage in what might very well be technological heresy. Other tech magi believed that cause espoused methods would lead to catastrophe. They were reticent to fashion liminal abrasers or risk charging them with empiric energy in case. In seeking to unmake the Necron's smothering shroud, they accidentally tore uncontrolled breaches into warp space. Even amongst those loyal to Kor's vision, there were those who allowed greed to override the Noctilith decree, or whose nerve faltered as their own warriors started to succumb to the stilling despite all their augmentations. They seized opportunities to harvest or scavenge from stilled worlds, ignored the distress calls of long-beleaguered elements of battlegroup Kalides or Orpheus, or even suborned the remnants of such forces into their own quests for personal power, rather than bolstering their positions as they should. The Cretian fleets that would seize deposits of Noctilith had a more aggressive focus than the Aegis fleets. Their cores compromised Forge World warships that carried large-scale ground attack forces made up of Sicarian killclades, Teraxi cyber flocks, and tireless Skitarii vanguard and ranger cohorts, as well as congregations of electro priests and all manner of swift transports and esoteric attack craft. It would be these that secured Noctilith sites once they had been located annihilating any foe already there and acting as a rapid response force to counter attempts to reclaim the sites. The ancient artifact vessels of the Accretion fleet also bore within their cavernous hulls large mining engines, 
dagger-tooled bore crawlers, multi-limbed excavators, and batteries of artillery-scale atomizers with which to pulverize layers of surface rock to reach the deposits of noctilith they sought. Immense petrolithic processor shrines in echoing loading arcades were wreathed in incense and ringed with choirs of chanting tech priests, preparing them to be loaded aboard monolithic dropships. Several accretion fleets incorporated vanguard squadrons of Navis Imperialis escorts, far more maneuverable than the lumbering forge ships that acted as the fleet's hunters and scouts in the void. Alongside these were gothic barks, hailing from several night worlds pledged in service to Omnissiah servants. The noble princeps, barons and knights had sworn great pledges to the fleet's master to see the grand work of cause design protected. The first system in which the Aegis fleets encountered a major established presence from battle group Cleides and Orpheus was Paradis. Here, on several battle-scarred worlds, Macroclades under Magos, Eradica Salt found grim-faced consolidated battalions of Imperial Guardsmen holding onto fortified depots and entrenched townships. Tank companies stood dug in along ridges, their fuel reserves having run so low that they were now operated as stationary artillery pieces. Pockets of battle sisters and adeptus ministorum preachers were spread amongst the defenders, anchor points of piety intended to stave off the worst effects of distilling. The skies above these exhausted armies were fouled by shoals of low-orbit debris from ferocious space battles. The landscapes in which they had held out for so long were scarred beyond all recognition. Once verdant plains had been reduced to blackened glass and jagged crater fields, mountain ranges had been entirely leveled. Seas and oceans boiled away, and entire cityscapes had become corpse-choked mausolea, where flesh and bone had taken the place of flakboard and mortar in the defenders' improvised barricades. Nor were these worlds free of foes. Active Necron threats persisted on every world in the Paradis system, while a handful of their dark, majestic warships hung in the void, as though observing the final defeat of the Imperial defenders from afar. The warships of the Aegis fleet drove those Necron tomb ships away, boarding actions launched by the Decimal Redemptor and Forge Pyre, seeing one of the alien warships scuttled before it could escape. With localized space secure for the moment, Mega Salt dispatched landing parties to answer the static-laced voice hails of the defenders below. His followers were forced to engage swarming canoptic hosts and lock-stepping ranks of android warriors from the moment they made landfall. While on Paradise IV, a hard core of anti-graphitic Xenos war engines wrought havoc amongst the first wave of Astra Militarum drop troops until several engines of the Legio Invicta could be deployed to eradicate the threat. As they pressed deeper into what remained of Stornvor's grand strategic fortress, the Aegis fleets encountered both increasing Necron resistance, but also the entrenched remains of those who had so long held out against the alien androids. At Vorshepta and Shentai, Astrakor and the intact stations encircling the Vorlian anomaly, further bastions of the Imperial forces were brought back into the fold. The men and women who defended these worlds and facilities had survived multiple attacks over an excruciatingly extended period all while their ranks and morale alike withered in the grip of the stilling. Only the space marine forces encountered by the Aegis fleet showed little physical exhaustion, though their armor was without exception chipped, scored, blackened and cracked, a mute witness to their endurance. These survivors had thrown back black-limbed horrors attacking in the dark of the night, marching Xenos legions on the blazing Paradis star and aerial assaults by droning masses of insectile constructs, all while the numbing grind of the Nephilim anomaly had worn at their resolve, yet neither it nor the Necrons had broken them. Many Aegis fleets suffered terrible casualties in battle with the Necrons they encountered. Aegis fleet Tereshent at Zydos and Aegis fleet Krang at the edge of the Vorlian anomaly were wiped out by huge hosts of the android Xenos. Others were forced to withdraw from the worlds they had come to reinforce before having had a chance to fully reinforce them. Their masters viewed safeguarding their own armies and resources for an attempt to elsewhere as a logical preference. 
Mosto dug in. They poured ever more industrial assets onto the world to complete the fortifications, even as their forces, supported by any survivors, attempted to hold back intensifying attack waves from multiple Necron dynasties. The Storm Lord Strike the Accretion fleets had pushed deeper into the Nephilim subsector. They sought Noctilith deposits, already marked on data charts as well as searching out new ones in systems whose names had, in some cases, been redacted from Imperial records. They also encircled more of the anomaly's periphery, heading to the galactic west and south. This frequently brought the ships of Battlegroup Hephaestus into contact with predatory Necron fleets belonging to the Mephrite and Nihalak dynasties. Some of the Xenos already occupied quarry worlds and, to the tech priest's concern, appeared to be extracting the Noctilith themselves. Other Necron forces belonging to the aggressive Novok dynasty descended on the Accretion fleet's forces as the tech priest Noctilith harvesters extracted the black mineral. The Necron's attacks upon the Accretion fleets bordered on the monomaniacal. Be it the fleets of Imperial void ships that held station above recaptured quarry worlds the ground forces they had landed to defend the extraction efforts, or indeed, the engines and personnel engaged in the quarrying itself. It seemed as though the Xenos wished to annihilate them entirely. Conversely, however, beleaguered Aegis fleets operating in the Vertigus and the Zeta-8 Hesper systems saw their android foes suddenly and completely abandon such efforts mid-battle. During heavy fighting against Zarakan legions on Tharia, Magos Ordinatus Zedovia was on the verge of ordering auto-destruct psalms to be triggered aboard her precious Ordinatus engine, rather than let the ancient artifact fall into the hands of inquisitive cryptics. Even as sheets of gorse energy crackled above the Ordinatus's blazing flanks and the wooden Magos made preparations to emulate her engine and the foe alike, the bombardment abated. Stuttering reports from across the quarry, reported Zarakan phalanxes abruptly retreating as though at some silent signal. The Xenos left only marauding packs of destroyers and flayed ones to menace the shattered Imperial lines and cover the retreat of the core dynastic soldiery. Eerie green beams of energy reached down from low orbit and raised the Necrons whenever they touched them, teleporting them away en masse in the minutes before the tomb ships in orbit also turned about and sped from the system's edge. Magos Dizovia slumped in her command throne, bewilderment and relief churning within her as reports flitted in of one zone after another secured and free from Xenos taint. No explanation would come from this miracle, but in its wake the Noctilith mining efforts amidst the ruins of Tharia were soon back to full efficacy. This was a scene that repeated in various permutations across almost a dozen fronts within the Nephilim anomaly. The pattern took time to reveal itself, for it was still difficult for individual Imperial fleets to compare notes. Yet eventually, Archmagos Call, hunched over a data lectern within the stratagem of the Tsarquisitor, began to craft a hypothesis from the scraps of intelligence he had accrued. The Archmagos' personal task force had descended on a Vertigus system to the galactic north here, his armies of Scitarii fought ambushing Necrons amidst the mining communes of Verticus II, while his warships did battle with those of the Xenos in the Cold Void. The situation on Verticus II deteriorated rapidly, as phalanx after phalanx of Necron warriors, immortals, and stilt-legged war engines appeared from shimmering portals, marched from rents in the plant's crust, or stalked from mine entrances lit by eerie emerald fire. Overseeing the battle from on high, Call was prepared to drop reserves of Iron Hand Space Marines and House Tarnas Knights into the fray planet side, when a second Necron fleet arrived in the system without warning. Legions of marching androids poured onto the planet from flickering beams emitted by soaring Necron aircraft or stepped from hovering slab-sided war machines. Yet, these newly arrived Xenos who displayed differing heraldry from those on Verticus II thus far, proceeded to ignore the Imperial forces entirely. They instead engaged the android legions that had, until that point, 
had been threatening to overrun the Archmagos' armies. Seizing his opportunity, Call issued a swift string of astute strategic directives. Explorator vessels fired their drives and swept onto new attack vectors, arcane batteries hammering the flanks of battling Necron vessels. Maniples of Warhound Titans loped out onto the attack, raking their fire through clashing Necron phalanxes, even as the Imperial Guard tank formations and formations of Martian cavalry surged in to shatter suddenly wavering enemy battle lines. Over several hours of ferocious fighting, the two opposing Necron forces utterly undermined one another's strategic positions and, harried by efficient Imperial counterattacks, were forced to disengage. Some of the Xenos vanished back through Dolmen Gates, while others fell back below the planet's surface, with rival Necrons still harrying them down into the darkness. By the time the last Necron forces had vanished from Verticus II's combat zones, Call had thoroughly analyzed the heraldic markings and strategic maneuvers of the rival Necron forces and cross-referenced them against vid captures from elsewhere in the Nephilim anomaly. Sure enough, he found repeating patterns and the beginnings of what appeared to be divided loyalties amongst the android Xenos. There was, Call concluded, some manner of alien civil war taking place within the Nephilim subsector. Now he had only to determine how best to exploit it. The Aegis fleet had now contacted most of the surviving enclaves of battle group Kalides and Orpheus. It appeared no senior commander from either force still lived. The zealous group master Malan himself was said to have fallen while stubbornly anchoring an especially desperate defense action over Cherist. A terrible being of living metal and flickering fractals was said to have struck him down with a bolt of infernal lightning though no body had ever been recovered. Regardless, the depths of the Ministorum had been swift to claim Marin as a saint of Cherist. There was, further, no sign of Marshal Arnulf nor Lieutenant Stornvor. There were only the worlds that they had conquered in their advance, and which in many cases remained, however tenuously, in Imperial hands. Garrisons left in their wake asserted that the two Space Marine war leaders had broken through the Necron blocking forces and continued their crusade on toward the heart of the Nephilim anomaly. For his part, Archimagos Call privately suspected the Space Marines' devotion to duty had seen them cut off and overwhelmed somewhere beyond the Tredica system. He kept such sentiments to himself, however, for the sake of morale. Whatever the case, under the direction of Group Master Vikren and Archimagos Call, and thanks partly to the escalating Necron civil war draining enemies from the front lines, Battle Group have faced us, had secured a solid foothold. Resurrecting elements of Stormvor's theoretical fortress, they had established a nominal stable front from the Lomor and Skaren systems through the Mitrican local space to the Vetrigus and Shentai systems in the galactic north of the region. Such a claim was a huge simplification of a complex and entangled interstellar war front that was constantly blighted by the deleterious effects of the anomaly. Nonetheless, a solid imperial foothold had been re-established in the Nephilim subsector. Like the hosts that came before them, however, Call and his followers were discovering that the longer they spent beneath the oppressive pile of the Nephilim anomaly, the worse it degraded and scattered their efforts. Moreover, while accretion fleets on Tharia, Observersi, and Eclandrica V had already met their noctilith harvesting quotas, their initial efforts to fashion liminal abrasias had met with little success. Worse, the few times a breakthrough had seemed likely, ferocious attacks by Necron forces had put a sudden halt to their work. Thanks partly to the pursuit of their own disparate agendas, and partly to a series of sweeping Xenos counteroffenses by Xenos identified as belonging to the Sharakan dynasty, Imperial momentum was faltering once more. It was in this time of growing frustration that Inquisitor Draxus boarded the Tsarquisitor under an energized falsehood. The Inquisitor explained to Archmagos Call that she had faked her own withdrawal from the war zone. After her success in the Tredica system had made a personal enemy of Illuminor Caesaris, she had been pursued by Deathmark assassins, 
making a feigned withdrawal a prudent measure. In truth, however, Drexus was certain that she now knew the secret to bring down the Necron pylons from within. Moreover, though she would not explain how, the Inquisitor claimed that she knew of an opportunity that was about to arise where she could put that knowledge to good use. We call support, Inquisitor Draxus claimed, she could decisively turn the tide of the war. Silence and Storm The Silent King had responded to Imatek's increasingly brazen and overt invasion with cold outrage. He had diverted legions of the Sharakan and Nefrak dynasties to meet the Sautek on several contested worlds. He had also made overtures to Orokin the Diviner, who he knew to be at large within the bounds of Nodal Matrix. There was no love lost between the Silent King and his former astrologer, but Cesarek hoped that Orokin's chronomatic insights might be enough to counteract Imatek's vaunted hyperlogical strategies. The Silent King's triarchal messages located Orokin on the lifeless world of Thig and sought to convince him of the importance of Cesarek's works. Orokin, however, declined an audience with the Silent King. He still pursued his own disturbing revelations and firmly believed that the threat of the coming calamity outweighed any concerns of conventional strategic warfare. Meanwhile, Imatek's legions had captured and firmly invested three full systems in the galactic northeast of the Nodal Matrix. Imatek had then allowed overlords of the Nefrak dynasty to batter his defenses with counterattacks that only served to exhaust his enemy's numbers. He had then employed an awakened Dolmen Gate to lead an assault in person halfway across the Nephilim subsector and strike the distant Myrtika system. The Stormlord's forces had emerged upon the contested world of Vegois Alphic, which played host to a mountainous pylon the Imperial invaders had yet so much as to scratch. Cesarek did not doubt that Imatek possessed weapons capable of toppling the structure, however, and knew he could not allow it. Sautek victory on this world might see a number of wavering dynasties defect to the Stormlord's banner. The Silent King thus charged the legions of Nemesor Uthmek, who had so far defended Vergois Alphic against all Imperial attacks with driving back Imatek's invasion. Uthmek responded with zeal, leading a planet-wide advance into the world's southern hemisphere to meet the Sautek invaders. Outnumbered Imperial forces and Vergois Alphic were swiftly crushed between warring aliens, yet Magnus Kantik Lundkest, overall commander of the Imperial fleet occupying the Myrtika system, only watched warily from afar. Let the Necrons fight, he thought. While they did so, they did not imperil his other holdings throughout the system. It was at this point that Inquisitor Draxus's compact war fleet translated into the Myrtikan system. She led an elite host of Martian terror troops and death-watched space marines, and was invested with the authority of Kaul and the Inquisition both. The Inquisitor commanded Magos Lundkest to provide her with martial support and diversionary assaults while she stuck at the Necron Pylon, now defended only by a skeleton garrison from Nemesor Uthmek's legions. Lundkest was far from delighted at this imposition, but he could hardly refuse. Even as Draxus's dropships streaked down through the atmosphere of Vergois Alphic, heavier landers bearing Magos Lundkest's heraldic crest put down a hundred-mile-wide cordon around the pylon. Skitarii legions and maniples of battle servitors dug in at his command. Cesarek loyal Necron forces turned back from their attacks upon Imatek's legions and battered the Imperial lines with increasing ferocity, yet they could not break through. The Storm Lord, for his part, now pulled his rear guard back from the planet's only dolmen gate and collapsed the structure after him. What perils Draxus and her team faced within the nightmare interior of the pylon were a mystery to Magos Lundkest, but the results of her efforts soon became clear. The bedrock of Vergois Alphic convulsed underfoot. Esoteric energy readings spiked alarmingly planet-wide. Lundkest issued evacuation orders, pulling all those forces he could out of battle and back towards orbit. His own ornate lander was powered up through the troposphere when the Magos saw the Necron pylon collapse into a star-bright singularity 
then detonate with enough fury to blast away the planet's atmosphere in tatters. Vogoy's Elphic was cracked all the way to its molten core by the fury of the detonation. Imperial losses were considerable, yet those suffered by the Nemesaur Uthmek were far worse, for, without the Dolmen Gate to escape through, almost all were trapped and slain. Having barely escaped the surface with his life, Magus Lundkest was somewhat curt in responding to the Inquisitor Draxus's brief vox missive of thanks for his aid. The Inquisitor had escaped, he knew not how, and was even now setting a course for the system's Mandeville point. She had felled a pylon, albeit at great cost. It seemed a decisive blow in the favor of the Imperial forces. At that moment, though, none present could truly appreciate the new and terrible phase of escalation Draxus's actions would soon bring to the war in the Nephilim Anomaly. Overlord Akthamek strode imperiously towards the Imperial positions. The humans had dug in amongst the last crumbling ruins of a once formidable line of fortifications that studded the valley's southern slope. Akthamek's Saltek Legion advanced across the valley floor towards them under a ceiling of slate-gray cloud. They waded shin-deep through muddy water, the product of the long-neglected dam at the valley's north end, having ruptured some days before. Such conditions did not trouble Akthamek. The android bodies of the Necrons were not like the primitive technologies of the lesser species, and suffered no ill effects from wading through water. The situation was, however, somewhat suboptimal. Akthamek was moving at the heart of his phalanx, his lich guard arrayed around him with their dispersion shields angled to protect him. He and his bodyguards inhabited powerfully built and diligently maintained bodies that pushed through the water's resistance with ease. The same was not so true of the ranks of warriors spread out ahead and to either side. Though Akthamek's foot soldiers forged on as best they could at his command, the shambling gate was exasperated by the water and the sucking mud of the valley floor. Akthamek and his elites were forced to slow their own pace to match the laboring warriors, much to his impatience. All the while, fire rained down from the human positions on the southern slope. The blocky structures of their fortifications might be half-collapsed and thick with rust and fern breaks, yet the solid mass of them still served to soak up all but the heaviest Necron firepower. Akthamek had to accept that the humans, for all their primitive nature, were making good use of their position. They had dug artillery pieces into the best protected areas of the slope and were dropping volleys of rockets onto the Necron ranks with an irksome degree of accuracy. Their foot soldiers, meanwhile, had entrenched themselves with good fields of fire across the valley and seemed to possess ample firepower. Most peeving of all from Akthamek's position was the presence of a band of what he believed the humans called Space Marines. Clad in armor of cobalt blue and wielding potent sidearms, the hulking warriors had already hurled back the first of Akthamek's warriors to gain the southern slopes, and were even now attempting to single him and his lich guard out with their potent firepower. Akthamek had envisioned a swift and glorious march to victory against what he had assumed were bedraggled victims cowering in their last bolt hole. This was to have been a clean and merciful execution. He allowed now that he might have underestimated his foe. The overlord's mood was not improved by the sensation of Capitec's baleful gaze boring into the back of his head. The plasmancer had been only too keen before the battle commenced to test his newly invented thermogravitic annihilator arrays on the humans. Akthamek, a firm believer in the triarchal code of honor and adherent to the edicts of the Silent King, had forbade the use of such grotesque and to his mind dishonorable overkill. From the raking blasts of plasma fire that Capitec kept hurling with such venom towards the human's positions, Akthamek suspected the plasmancer was feeling more than a little aggrieved about the whole business. Aksumik was hardly delighted himself. He would have preferred not to suffer such losses against so paltry seeming an enemy, for he had committed to his position now, and to relent 
without good cause would be unseemly. Instead, Aksamek raised his staff of light, striking a suitably noble pose, and issued a string of protocol imperatives. Lowly bond serfs of the glorious dynasty are to disperse their formation, the better to confound the unworthy efforts of the foe. Press the attack on all fronts, and without relent. Such is your master's decree. Kapatek, the Emolia Triarch of Tekan, most valued counselor to the master of the glorious dynasty, is to focus his wrath upon the feeble and cowardly artillery positions of the foe. Such is your master's decree. Swift chariots of cosmic conquest, poised amidst the firmament, awaiting only your master's bidding. No, the command is now given. Descend in wrath resplendent, and punish his foes for their ignorance and misplaced defiance. Such is your master's decree. With his protocols issued, Akthomek gestured to his glitch guard to commence their advance again. Satisfaction, tingling with anticipation, replaced the annoyance of a moment before. The overlord was not ashamed to admit to himself the enjoyment he derived from watching the mighty legions of the Sao Tech dynasty humble the enemies of the Silent King. For a few moments, the fight continued much as it had before. The Necrons waded relentlessly through the waters and raked the enemy positions with gorse fire. The humans returned fire and sent geysers of flame and water leaping high with the detonations of their artillery barrages. Then came the rising scream of antigravitic actuators, heralding dark shapes that dropped with suicidal speed through the roof of cloud above the battlefield. A wing of doom size plummeted groundward, each curving silhouette emblazoned for an instant against the sky. Behind them streaked a swarm of tomb blades, their shadow looms making them look as though each trailed a tattered death shroud. Enemy fire tracked up, seeking to knock these newcomers from the skies, but Actomek was satisfied to see their efforts falling pitifully short. Few creatures of flesh and blood could have endured the G-forces incurred as a Necron attack craft pulled up, then hurtled in fractal attack vectors across the flooded valley. Fans of water rose in their wakes as Akthomek's chariots of cosmic conquest shot low over his foot soldiers and commenced their attack run. A crimson glare danced across the water and glinted in the eyes of Akthomek's foot soldiers as the doom size fired their death rays. The energy beams tore up the valley slope and ripped through fortified structures, causing them to explode like fragmented shells. Human bodies were hurled through the air, or briefly picked out as blackened stick figures that scattered in ashes an instant later. Aximek's peerless visual acuity captured every satisfying detail and a clarity no organic organ could match. Even as the doom size swept up and away to loop around for another run, so the tomb blades hurtled into the attack. Aximek's enjoyment was marred only a little, as the enemy space marines, the cursed may they be, directed a ferocious volley into the light attack craft and punched several from the air. One tomb blade spiraled into a bunker wall and detonated into a geyser of green flame. Another cartwheeled madly up the hill before slamming into a boulder with terminal finality. The remainder, however, swept over the humans' positions and bathed them in arcing lightning as they went. Aksamek, whose front ranks of warriors were now trudging, dripping out of the mire, felt a flush of triumph. Surely the closing moments of the engagement were at hand. Then came another howl of engines, their rough timber unmistakably the product of human artifice. Perfect visual clarity, Aksamek reflected, was less of a blessing when it showed him a trio of enemy aircraft hurtling up the valley and pummeling his vaunted chariots with fire. A doom size erupted in midair, its ragged carcass tumbling away to slam into the north slope of the valley. Another was clipped and forced to disengage, wheeling off in a drunken arc with emerald smoke billowing from its fuselage. The third evaded as the enemy strike craft, plated in the same cobalt armor as the space marines, raced past. It performed a lightning-fast wing-over and dropped in behind their formation. Tesla destructors spitting bolts of lightning. 
The dogfighting aircraft hurtled over the rim of the valley and were gone. With the immediate aerial threat removed, the humans rallied. Their zeal was, in Athamek's opinion, becoming gauche. Another volley from the space marines saw several more tomb blades blown apart or sent spinning away to explode, leaving a mere handful of the swift vehicles to continue harassing the foe. Meanwhile, a howling mass of human soldiery pelted down the slope led by an officer who brandished a saber in one hand and a tattered banner in the other. The host of soldiery impacted Axomex warriors and drove them back into the waters again with many casualties. This, the overlord reflected, had gone beyond a joke. He was preparing to join the fight and dirty his hands in person when he froze rigid. A communication, he realized. A protocol edict beamed through the void from somewhere off-world. It thrummed with the unmistakable carrier signifiers of the Triarch Praetorians. The communication was instantaneous. Information delivered with such quick silver elegance that it took even his enhanced mental architecture a moment to comprehend its meaning. Somewhere in the nodal matrix, the humans had committed an atrocity, he discovered. Their defiance was no longer to be viewed with indulgence, nor their peoples to be accorded the honor of martial parity. Axomek did not fully understand the nature of what had happened. Understanding, seemingly, was not deemed necessary. But he grasped the import. The codes had been revoked. This foe need no longer be extended either respect or mercy. Axomek felt Capitec's eagerness from half a battlefield away. He knew now that he had no argument to countermand the cryptic, no grounds upon which to counsel restraint. With reluctance, Axomek commanded his followers to withdraw. He almost pitied the ignorant humans as they cheered and waved their flag, leaving themselves victorious. This would all be over soon, he knew. The thermogravitic annihilators would have the humans after all, and Axomek doubted that their effects would be merciful. Fatal Errors Arcana Unleashed The fall of the Virgois Alphic Pylon sent ripples through the contra-immaterial nodal matrix. Energinistic feedback caused the operation of several other pylons to fluctuate wildly and triggered everything from localized explosions and power failures to rashes of malfunction and madness amongst Necron soldiery that inexplicably drove many into the embrace of the destroyer cults. The oppressive shroud lifted notably throughout the Metika system and into regions beyond. None of this went unnoticed by the architects of the nodal matrix. Illuminor Caesares was caught between fascination, grudging admiration, and indignant outrage, as his otherworldly oculoscopes showed him the trauma to the nodal matrix. The ancient scientists wondered in that moment if the humans realized the two consequences of what they had done. The pylons were technology both ancient in origin and yet absolutely cutting edge in its implementation by the Necrons. No species in the history of the galaxy had attempted to employ them in the manner that Caesarus and Cesarek currently were. Even the Illuminor himself, with all his towering intellect, did not fully understand the extent of the energies they sought to tremel, or what would happen if that control were interrupted. Would the influence of the Immaterium resurge, snapping back like overstretched elastic suddenly released? Would the competing forces of the warp and counter-warp clash with destructive results? One thing Cesarus was certain of, however. The humans had sealed their doom by their actions. Until this moment, the Silent King had been content to treat these interlopers with the same mingling of honor and disdain that he approached the populations of orcs, kin, and other such flesh and blood aliens still fighting to resist within the boundaries of the nodal matrix. They were enemies, certainly, but they were also a part of the experiment and, perhaps, the solution of reversing biotransference. Furthermore, with the extent of the one unfortunate incident in the Tredica system, they had proven ultimately incapable of causing serious damage to the Silent King's plans. Cesarek was glad of suitably tenacious and capable enemies to test his legions against, 
as long as they presented no threat to the pylons themselves. That, it seemed, was no longer the case. Thus, just as Illuminor Caesarus knew he would, the Silent King soon issued a new decree that echoed to the farthest corners of the Nephilim sector. The humans fighting in this region, the humans fighting in this region, had engaged in a dishonorable act of grand sabotage, and might well be capable of doing so again. By this act, they had proven themselves unworthy of the triarchal codes of honorable combat. This was no longer a war. Now it was an extermination, and one in which no weapon or technology was to be considered taboo, provided it brought swift victory and safeguarded the continued expansion of the nodal matrix. The Technomandrites fighting under Cesarek's banner did not trouble themselves to conceal their delight at this announcement. Cesarus himself was scarcely less gleeful, and nor were many of the cryptics and overlords who had thus far held back the most terrifying weaponry in their arsenals in the name of decency and honor. No longer would they be so constrained. The humans were about to discover the true and terrible might of the ancient beings with whom they had chosen to war. The Omnissiah's Gift It had by now become apparent to the Tech Magi leading corps' accretion fleet that attempting to fashion liminal abrasers would be neither a swift process nor a simple one. Most of the Archmagos's war leaders still venerated his wisdom and were thankful for the gifts of knowledge he had offered them. Yet even the most loyal had long ago abandoned any idealistic hopes of swiftly crafting wonder weapons that would banish the Nephilim anomaly in short order. Thus, many tech priests secretly congratulated themselves on the foresight they had shown in bringing with them esoteric weapons and strange devices that could conceivably be used to gain an advantage over the alien foe. Indeed, so pleased with themselves were the tech clergy, and so secretive in their habits, that few amongst them realized the extent of the perilous treasure trove they had amassed, nor interrogated their motivations for doing so. It was not unusual, after all, for the servants of the machine god to make use of his bounteous gifts. Yet, had they realized it, even the most obtuse amongst Kaul's followers would have been surprised to learn that they had, between them, brought an arsenal of ancient weapon technologies greater and more terrible than any wielded by any single other Indomitus Crusade battle group. Among these terrible treasures were some of the fabled war engines of the Centurio Ordinatus, colossal super-heavy weapons platforms, mounting unique energy cannons, or legendary artillery batteries. Other tech priests had acquired arcane explosive devices, vats of alchemical corrosives, artifacts that supposedly initiated geoforming catastrophes, or manipulated the fundamental forces of the galaxy. All of these ancient mechanisms and technologies were precious beyond measure. Many were also forbidden by auto-scripture, or even deemed heretical. Yet in each case, those magi who had spirited the weapons out of code-locked vaults or committed veiled acts of espionage and violence to secure them would have sworn that they did so in good faith. Some felt that they had been moved by the spirit of the Omnissiah itself. Others had performed lengthy strategic cogitations whose conclusions had been inescapable. Once beyond the veil of the Silent Zone, they would have need of archaeotechnological superweapons, prescribed or no. Those who had brought such terrible devices to the Nephilim Anomaly kept them safe in multi-warded chambers aboard their flagships, or in the case of those deemed too hazardous, in thickly shielded tender barges on the fringes of their fleets. They also kept them secret, certainly from the likes of Archmagos Kor and the tech clergy of any other fleet in the battle group, but also from as many of their peers as was practical. Still, Rumor tinged the noospheric information cloud surrounding the fleet's Adeptus Mechanicus vessels. The names of devices such as the Yoctoparticulate Crucible, Dvorel's Necrogastigrax, and the Cyclofox Determination were whispered with mingled awe and unease. The first indication of the havoc such devices would unleash came when the Lomos system was subjected to a fresh Cesarican onslaught. 
powering arrogantly into the system aboard a fleet of tomb ships, the Necron invasion force was amongst the largest deployed since the first counterattacks against battle group Kaladis. It was led by the infamous Pharon, Nectaric of the Thokt dynasty, renowned not only for her strategic acumen, but also for the cruel relish she took in exterminating her enemies like vermin. Crucially, amidst her coterie of advisors were a trio of technomandrites known as the Eyes of the Void. These immoral cosmic engineers had furnished Nectaric with further technological horrors to augment her already nightmarish personal armory, and they were only too eager to see them unleashed upon the human interlopers. Staying clear of Cheris' formidable orbital defenses, Firang Nectaric instead deployed invading hosts to the surface of the neighboring world of Torantes. Though the Stelling had long since reduced the planet's population centers to haunted ruins, still it boasted the most sizable Astra Militarum garrison in the system, as well as several Munitorum supply depots of massive size. The Pharon intended to show the defenders of Cherist what was coming for them by first making an example of Tarantis's defenders. Nectaric unleashed the full fury of her stable of ancient war engines and gave the eyes of the void free reign from the off. Doom stalkers picked their way through the war-torn streets of Tarantis's hives, towering over the advancing Necron soldiery and unleashing the cosmic energies of experimental weaponry upon the hapless Astra Militarum defenders. Hundreds of human soldiers were blasted into carbonized statues, reduced to the component atoms, or tattered apart like screaming clouds caught in a hurricane's winds. The Aquilitus spaceport fell to a spearhead thrust by doomsday arcs, and seraptic heavy constructs coupled with the dimensional raiding party of Hexmark destroyers, who emerged within the port subterranean bunker complex and slaughtered every Imperial officer trapped there. Even the warlord titan, Dracos Apocalistor, was laid low after being confronted with a trio of tesseract arcs as it sought to retake the Herald's Bridge over the River Pergus. Answering increasingly frantic calls for aid, two entire Aegis fleets sped from void anchorages at the system's spywood edge to reinforce Tarantis. Magus Oradi and Manipulus Prime Bezd, the masters of the two fleets, commanded a combined force capable of meeting Nectaric's legions both in the void and on Tyrannus's burning surface. However, each had also secretly placed their hopes in the arcane superweapons hidden in their deepest vaults. Magos Oradi unleashed his secret arcana even as the two loyalist fleets engaged the tomb ships in Tarantian local space. This device, known as the Ark of Oblivion, was fired like a torpedo from Maradi's flagship, the Ex Machinus, with its safety wards removed and fully awakening protocols cracking through its ominous black outer shell. The arc streaked into the heart of the Necron fleet before unleashing a devastating contramolecular shockwave. Three mighty tomb ships shuddered in the grip of the arc's power, the living metal of their hulls and their luckless passengers vibrating itself to a spreading slurry as excitation fields rippled through them. The attack turned the void battle decisively in the humans' favor. However, thanks to a lack of warning from the secretive Oradi, Manipulus Prime Bezd saw significant casualties amongst her dropped forces, as a number of their landing craft were also caught in the outermost ripples of the detonation. Outraged at what they saw as the ignorant and clumsy deployment of a weapon that was beyond the humans' true ken, the eyes of the void responded by unshackling their own most devastating and unpredictable weapon. Through processes unknown beyond the technomandrite cabals, they had splintered a shackled shard of Lash Udra and bound its energistic fragments into a thousand strong swarm of canoptic constructs that they now unleashed. Burning with geist-like energy, shuddering in and out of sync with reality, the ravening swarm overran several beleaguered Astra Militarum regiments before sweeping down upon the drop sites where Manipulus Prime Bez's landing parties were still attempting to reorder their strength. The constructs brought with them, their mechanoid chittering echoed within the minds of their victims, 
even as those same doomed warriors felt their consciousness dividing into fractal compounds. Soon, they could not tell if they looked through their own eyes or those of the horrors attacking them, and Skitarii turned upon Skitarii in nightmare combat. Rather than endure such a hideous fate, Bez resolved to unleash her own secret weapon of the Omnissire. None beyond Demanipolis Prime and her inner circle would ever know the true nature of this device, however. For the moment, its empiric baffles were lowered, its ancient power source reacted in unexpected ways to the powers of Lash Udra. The result was a silent orb of steadily expanding darkness, dancing with blue-white skeins of energy and churning with myriad suggestions of somehow insectile movement that consumed Bezd and her maniples in a matter of minutes. The unleashed calamity did not stop there. The orb of darkness continued to grow, swallowing up first the armies warring around it, then hundreds of miles of Tyrannus's surface. Humans and Necrons alike died fighting as the darkness swept over them, or else fled before the annihilating energies in the hopes of outrunning them. By the time the orb finally stopped growing and vanished like a popped bubble, it had erased a third of Tarantus's mass, along with countless billions of living organisms. In its wake, it left a ravaged planet tumbling out of its orbitary trajectory. The evacuated and shell-shocked remnants of once mighty armies and a plague of nightmares and strange visions that would bedevil the remaining inhabitants of the Lomor system long after the Sharakan offensive ground to a close. The nightmarish conclusion to the Tarantian campaign repeated in myriad forms across the Nephilim subsector. Apocalyptic reprisal followed unleashed atrocity as martial scientists and engineers of destruction on both sides sought to bring the war to a decisive end. On Thalsifer, Magos Einwald Viridian unleashed Moragar Fex's Hyperalembic upon the Orusk legions of overlord Kutmek. Necrons and Imperial forces alike were reduced to bubbling slime by the resultant non-viral outbreak, and the entire planet had to be quarantined to prevent its further spread. In the Zahn system, a concerted Imperial push upon the void-born Necron pylon triggered a massive naval engagement that was, in turn, thrown into chaos by the efforts of a cabal of Cesarex plasmancers. The bound dwarf star they propelled into Imperial Navy formations wrought catastrophic damage and killed billions in minutes. However, a desperate ramming action by the Chalice-class cruiser Silence in Suffering shattered one of the stellar shackles containing the star's power. Resultant uncontrolled flares raked the Zahn pylon, overloading several of its quantum shields and causing substantial damage. Iridhel, Namen Ten, Obalt. Each world saw its own calamity as dreadful forces were unleashed. Ark Magos Call learned of the spreading madness when a deputation of Space Marine and Battle Sister War Leaders came in person to confront him with vid capture and collated reports of almost a dozen separate disasters. Call had been isolated from the strategic picture for some time by a combination of the Nephilim anomalies smothering Paul and his own obsessive efforts to fashion a successful liminal abraser. Now he recognized that, perhaps in response to the questing tendrils of the stilling, he had thrown himself into his experiments with an obsessive focus that had seen him neglect his wider responsibilities. The Archmagos issued an immediate command decree, intended for every Imperial commander and Tech Magos in the war zone. Call commanded that no further gifts of the Omnissiah were to be unleashed without full understanding and his explicit authorization. Yet the Nephilim anomaly remained as difficult to navigate or force messages through as it had been since the campaign's beginning. The Archmagos' commands were slow to spread, especially to more isolated fleets. More than one Magos chose to blame such difficulties and ignore their master's decree even when it did reach them. With two pylons now felled and another sorely damaged by the incautious efforts of his own followers, the Silent King watched the war develop with disquiet. The lie had been put to the inviability of his contra-immaterial nodal matrix. 
The Storm Lord continued to make territorial gains to the galactic north and east of the region. And, to Cesarek's disgust, appeared to be leaving the humans to their own devices in favor of pursuing his civil war. Cesarek recognized the disquiet amongst the dignitaries of war leaders of his court. His triarchal advisors were bound to obey him by ancient codes, but could not disguise their disquiet at the dishonorable weapons the Silent King had unleashed. On the other hand, the Technomandrite's displeasure became more pronounced with every Necron defeat by what they saw as inferior human technologies. Some overlords petitioned to be allowed to turn their force against the upstart Cesarkans and their allies, while others already assigned the duty complained that they yearned to exterminate the human infestation. Cesarek knew that he needed a clear and decisive victory over at least one of his enemies, both to take pressure off his military forces and to silence the dissenting murmurs on the political front. After long deliberation, he chose the human threat as his priority. Crush them, Cesarek reasoned, and he would be freed to turn his attention upon Imhotek. He doubted that the Storm Lord's more fair-weather supporters would remain loyal for long, with the full might of the loyal Necron forces bearing down upon them. To this end, Necron legions throughout the Nephilim subsector advanced on every Imperial-held system compromising Stormvor's fortress. Huge fleets of Cesarican, Nihilac, and Orusk tomb ships intercepted far-ranging accretion fleets in the deep void after the Imperial ships were forced by the anomaly to crash translate back into real space. Freshly bolstered Imperial worlds in the Mirtika and Shentai systems were invaded once more by dynasties loyal to the Silent King, their pharaohs seeking to achieve swift and crushing victories over the humans, using whatever weapons were necessary. Cryptech hyperscience now came to the forefront of the conflict like never before. Necron forces across the Nephilim subsector activated and deployed the most powerful and often the most unstable and hazardous artifacts at their command. Cryptech's allied to the Silent King were urged to cripple or annihilate human resistance with speed, regardless of the cost in catastrophic collateral damage to continents, planets, stars, or entire systems. Devices were unleashed that uncoiled graffitic ribbons thousands of miles long like titanic whips the hypercharged planetary crust into electrifying terminals that fragmented or flattened mountain ranges with magnetoplasmic beams or loosed howling gales of planar slivers to flay armies down to atoms. At Zeta-8 Hespus, Cryptex of the Nyak dynasty unleashed a shocking ten Catan shards upon a single war zone, seeing the god Echo's destructive potential as outweighing the risk of allowing such insane shadows of malice to congregate. Of course, not all nobles followed the Silent King's command in good faith. Some overlords and cryptex sought to carve out their own dynastic territories during the great push into the human-held systems, or to settle grudges sixty million years in the souring. Others, afflicted by personal degradation and hibernation madness, fought whatever foes their comprised senses showed them, or unleashed their arsenals of cosmic weaponry in random and reckless fashion. Only Imhotek and his legions refrained from joining in their escalating arms race that now racked the nodal matrix. The Storm Lord, instead, withdrew forces from some locations and fortified others, watching and waiting to see what would occur. The Skaran Breach on multiple fronts across more than a half dozen planetary systems, cataclysmic hyper-technological war raged. The Imperial defenders were rocked onto their heels by the force of the Necron's onslaught, wrestling with the ongoing hardships of the stilling, even as the conflict demanded new reserves of quick thinking and determination from them. Overwhelmed commanders were driven to increasingly desperate measures to maintain the fracturing integrity of Stormvor's fortress. Never had the effect of the nodal matrix worked more in the favor of the Necrons. Untroubled as they were by its smothering shroud, employing quantum communications across interstellar distances, the Xenos coordinated their legions as a single, if somewhat ponderous, army. Attacks against individual worlds or systems were timed to coincide with other offensives 
taking place light years distant, but whose effect would inevitably bear upon one another. These were not quite the sprawling clockwork maneuvers of the Storm Lord, but Cesarek's grasp of strategy was fearsome in its own right. Imperial commanders, by comparison, often fought alone. Defenders of systems, planets, sometimes even individual cities or fortifications were unable to force messages through the effects of the Nephilim anomaly. Where before these issues could be ameliorated, to some degree at least, by swift messenger frigates, now the danger was too omnipresent and developing too swiftly to allow such lag. Exhausted, demoralized, increasingly fearful, Kor's armies faced the very real possibility of a defeat even more complete than that which had befallen battle group Calides and Orpheus. Rather than countenance defeat, many cast aside the Archmagos's edict and turned to the superweapons of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Yet worn down and rendered fallible as they were, those who wielded such dimly understood technologies were more likely than ever to make fatal errors in their deployment. They were also less able to discern the rash of disturbing omens and strange visions that beset them during these desperate days, as being phenomena in their own right than the ongoing effects of the anomaly. Matters finally came to a head in the Skaran system. Early in battle group Hephaestus's advance into the Nephilim anomaly, Memidominus Gelf had led his accretion fleet to this system and had successfully driven local Necron forces back from several worlds. He had focused his efforts around the feral world of Santis Magna, employing mammoth regolith Delver engines to quarry the precious substance from the world's bedrock. Necron raiding parties had struck at Santis Magna several times, but on each occasion, Gelf's prodigious void fleet and disciplined Martian Skitarii had thrown them back. Yet, Imperial counterattacks had proven equally ineffective. The Necrons had a pylon in the Skaran system, a monstrous thing that pierced the moon of Skaran's coil from pole to pole. It, and the asteroidal masses gravitethered into its orbit, had all been heavily fortified and resisted any Imperial efforts at invasion. Thus, though the Myrmidominus's labors had seen an impressive quota of Noctilith harvested and the beginnings of Liminal Abrasor taking shape, he had been unable to prevent the Necrons or the cruel effect of their pylon wearing away at his mind and maniples both. In the cycles leading to the Silent King's massed onslaught, Gelf and his underlings experienced increasingly unsettling manifestations. Machine spirits became truculent, delaying mining operations and collapsing the void shields of several fortified forge shrines. Servitors suffered grotesque seizures and jabbered nonsensical mathematical equations that seemed to recur with viral tenacity in the nemo circuitry of any tech priest that heard them. Readouts from system augers, dismissed as faulty data scripture, suggested that the planets and moons of the system were approaching a trigonometrical alignment that should not have been possible given their disparate orbital paths. Then there were the phantom energy spikes that originated from seemingly random points in the interplanetary void and matched no known pattern of wave or frequency within the data stacks of the Myrmidominus's fleet. Gelf himself suffered during this period also. The Myrmidominus's fleet's lieutenants noted his behavior becoming increasingly erratic and paranoid. Concerns were raised when Gulf revealed the contents of the warded Requery barge that had long hung upon the periphery of his fleet, a network of ancient micro-servitor satellites bristling with unidentifiable weapon systems that he called Shivarik's Constellation. Such worries only deepened when the Myrmidominus ritually synced his consciousness with the machine minds of the Constellation and then recused himself to his personal sanctum, ordering the devices be released into the void to do what he called their holy work. This decision seemed prescient, however, when a mighty Necron fleet streaked without warning from the deep void to invade the Skaran system. Boasting warships and phalanxes of the Sazarakan, Oroskar, and Nihilak dynasties, it was a terrifyingly powerful alien host, sufficient to crush the Accretion fleet several times over. Alarm bells tolled through the decks of Imperial warships, 
Binaric activation canticles blurted from emitters across the surface of Santis Magna. Imperial war hosts rushed to make ready, their efforts hampered by malfunctioning technologies and the premature senescence of distilling. A spearhead of strike cruisers belonging to the Silver Templars and Hawk Lords powered out to meet the foremost Necron ships and by time for the defenders to dig in. Yet they were swiftly outmaneuvered as, employing localized quantum tunneling beams that tore shortcuts through the stuff of reality itself, a formation of tomb ships leapt past the space marine craft and into high orbit above Santis Magna. A punishing bombardment of gravimetric and chronophagic weaponry followed, despairing, suffering and sustainable casualties at a terrifying rate, the planet-side Magi unleashed every weapon they could at the Necron fleet with apocalyptic results. Yet, for every tomb ship ravaged by atomics or set ablaze by phosphor chem warheads, another was already beaming entire phalanxes of warriors and war engines onto the planet's surface. Memidominus Gelf wrestled with the ancient and impossibly complex systems of Shiverick's constellation. Paranoid whispers within his augmented cortex warned that the weapons had been sabotaged by his detractors and convinced the dangerously deranged Magos to disable the satellite safety regulators in the hopes of forcing them into operation. Deep in the void, 25 weapon satellites from the dark age of technology crackled with sudden overcharge. One by one, their corrupted machine minds achieved chorustry and their microthrusters propelled them into an arcane alignment thousands of miles across that had nothing to do with Gelsa's increasingly frantic commands. Energy weapons that had been ancient when the God Emperor ascended his throne thrummed to life and prepared to fire. The first volley lit the firmament with coruscating lines of inimical energy that bifurcated one tomb ship eviscerated another two, and sighed through four imperial warships. Cries of alarm filled the human and alien communication networks alike as Shiverick's constellation realigned with incredible speed, then fired again. More warships from both sides died, even as their crews attempted to comprehend how their shielding and defense measures had been so contemptuously bypassed. The satellites realigned and fired, realigned and fired, each volley leaving behind its incredibly complex energy glyphs that overlapped one another against the blackness of the void. Flaming wrecks tumbled through space, venting escape craft and blazing wreckage. The one-sided battle descended into anarchy, as some shipmasters sought to escape the wholesale destruction while others, gripped by zeal and xenophobia, attempted to capitalize upon it. Then came an almighty convulsion of reality. At the heart of the maze of criss-cross energy glyphs, the fabric of real space bowed in a fish-eye distortion that spread and grew by the moment. Waspex's shrieked warnings that overloaded as impossible energy spikes drove their governing machine spirits instantly mad. Cryptex worked frantically at the controls of hyperspatial oculites, cursing in bewilderment as impossible contradictory readouts flashed across their instruments. The satellites of Shiverex constellation detonated one after another in a rippling string of explosions whose flames swirled through the void towards the swelling distortion like a vortex, even as their feedback painted Mermaid Dominus Gulf's sanctum with his ejected brain matter. All the released energies of the satellites and their glowing glyphs flowed inwards, building at the center of the fisheye distortion to a glowing point that became a rupture then burst outward in a guise of rejected ectoplasm and tattering unreality. Ghost light blazed like a newborn star at the heart of the Skaran system, as something psychopean and dreadful bored its way through into real space from the liminal zones beyond. A shock wave of empiric corruption rolled out from the emergence point, mutilating countless machines before slamming into the Skaran pylon and reversing its war polarity in a ferocious storm of crimson lightning. Gravity distorted, and an epidemic of earthquakes and floods tore at every world in the system, as an infernal planetary body of colossal size manifested at the system's heart. Wormwood had come. The grotesque demon world of Vashtor the Archiphane 
blazed like a poison star. Vashtor the Archiphane climbed a spiral stair that wound its way up through one of the myriad dark towers that rose from the surface of Wormwood. The walls of the tower were made from hundreds of thousands of huge cogs laid one on top of the other. Many of the cogs were the width of Vashtor's clawed and wizened hand. Some were thirty feet thick, others as insubstantial as a mortal's dream. The cogs rotated. Their axis was the corporeal real space manifestation of Vashtor himself as he climbed a helix of stairways, one of rippling mercury, one of burned corpses reinforced with copper bolts, one of forced theorems written in oily blood, everyone unique. Up through the cog's center, the cog's flat planes ground against one another with a grumbling and screeching tumble of noise that rolled between the smog-spewing towers before vanishing amidst the louder industrial clangor of the demon world's lowlands. The demon demigod reached the tower top and gazed out upon the wreck-strewn starfield of the Skaran system where it spread across the heavens above. The nearest planet, he saw, was even now in its death throes. Wormwood's immaterial gravity, the energies that had gone into its making, tore at the luckless world so that its continents writhed and cracked. Oceans boiled and scoured the land. Mountains crumbled upwards. Millions of tiny, squirming beings tumbled up from the world's surface into the cold of the killing void. He saw scattered like haloing flies around the dying world the ships of the humans and others of Necrons. Two most agreeable species, in Vashtor's estimation, pliant, easily encouraged, and so delightfully inventive. Alas, that your erasure must I engineer here in this place, for you are now but grit in the flywheels to be whisked away. Machines have you made for such purpose as I cannot condone. The Archiphane turned the entire tower top with a sweeping gesture of his hammer. Cogs span around one another in screeching welters of sparks. Cyclopean pistons thundered deep below Vashtor's hooves as the tower craned at his urging to show him a new view. There it lay, far across the void, a pylon fashioned in the ancient style that the Archiphane knew so well. The devices were a little like him, he ruminated. Above such linear constraints as time or natural physics, here now, in this benighted hour, just as they had been in the first days. And yet, uses I shall find for your noble matrix, little king. Lengths yet are there to which you have not been driven. Mayhap, mayhap I shall wield the goad. Vashtor chided himself mentally. The problem with real space, he thought, was the way in which some things were and others weren't. How he always had to adjust to notions like had been or were not yet. It would all come in good time, of course. The thought coaxed fresh billows of fume from the demon's vents and caused ropes of acrid pollutant to drool from its fox grill more. First, though, there were more pragmatic matters to attend to. Details of corporeal strategy must be managed in the linear theater. Fully awakened as it was, Wormwood was, in Vashtor's estimation, virtually unassailable by conventional armies. The corrupted webway tunneling engine churning at its heart had enabled it to bypass the Necron's nodal matrix, while the Archiphane's infernal artifice had allowed him to corrupt the nearby pylon whose influence might otherwise have started to wear away at the demon world from the moment of its emergence. Best of all, Vashtor felt the empowerment of worship flowing into him from all across the benighted war zone. So many willful acts of technological destruction had been committed. Such a wealth of brilliant minds had allowed their own corruption at the goading of his imps, or thanks to their own misplaced sense of faith or patriotism. Ignorance of one's own devotions, the demon reflected, had ever been the bane of such intellects, and never, in the final reckoning, an effective defense for those who were quite sure of their secularity. 
For all his advantages, however, the Archivain had come to a region the very nature of which had been rendered utterly inimical to his kind. One misstep, the slightest moment of complacency, could see his plans cast down in ruin. The Archivain could not allow that. After all, his search had barely begun. Thanks, steam and iron and pain for my cogs, then, he muttered to himself. Another sweep of his hammer, another titanic industrial convulsion of the tower beneath him, and Vashtor was looking out upon wave after wave of attack craft, spreading out from Wormwood's orbit to fall upon the shattered human and Necron forces. He saw the pugnacious warships of Chaos Space Marine warbands, the jagged vessels of Dark Mechanicum covens writhing, wreathed in roiling fume and leaping energies, and confections of flesh and metal, tentacle and wing and flame that were demon warships making sail on tides of pain and fear. Many of these, he knew, had taken to travel in the wake of Wormwood, daring the rotted, cog-churned passageways it bored through liminal space and that collapsed gradually after its passing. Others were dark pilgrims drawn to Wormwood by strange visions or a desire for their Archiphane's blessings and established strongholds amongst the perilous environs. Then, of course, there were the many demonic entities indentured to his service. All would wreak havoc in the Archiphane's name. All would seek to catch his eye and win his approbation, almost as though he were a fully-fledged Chaos God already. The notion pleased him. It also spared him the mundane considerations of war, at least for the time being. Let his cogs infest the mechanism of that which was real in this place. Let them descend upon human and Necron alike, and render them into offerings they hoped would please him. Already the carnage had begun. Vashdor could sense bloodshed and terror, engine deaths and rites of mechanized carnage. He sensed more than saw the flaring drives of warships fleeing from the system's edge, the bright machine mind of the Necron's leader flaring in speculation and amazement at what it had witnessed, the steely determination of space marines fighting their way clear to report what they had seen. Sparks, he rumbled to himself, dismissing the battling mortals after only the briefest considerations. Vashtor had great works to undertake in this region of the galaxy, mighty revolutions of cog and gear to set in motion. He could not trouble himself with the petty flickerings of mortal thought and deed. Not yet, at any rate. The Archiphane would attend to his labors, and afterwards, he promised himself, he would have some fun. A Scattered and Shattered Realm the Nephilim sector was no longer silent. War, increasingly bitter, desperate and arcane, raged on countless worlds, as well as beneath their surfaces and in orbit around them. Cathedrals of crenellated industry, manned by macroclades of Skitarii and battle servitors, fought with every bionic servo and sinew of their remaining flesh to throw back legions of deathless necrons. Hosts of space marines, battle sisters, and the last haunted remnants of once proud Imperial Guard regiments warred for survival against overwhelming enemy strength. From his command sanctum aboard the Tsar Quesitor, Belisarius Call watched the fragmented strategic picture with growing frustration. The situation was in a constant flux across a region so colossal as to utterly overmaster human comprehension. The Ark Magos knew the horrors he studied were gross simplifications, and that the orders he issued were merely the best guesses of Vicrian's high command staff rendered, in many cases, long after the situation on the ground had changed beyond recognition. Adding to Kor's dismay was a rampant destruction unleashed by his fellow Magi and against his express command. He could not help but wonder what Primarch Gilliman would make of the atrocities unleashed by the servants of the Machine God in Victory's name, or the terrible damage wrought upon the worlds they had ostensibly been sent to save. His own scheme for the creation of liminal abrasers had still to bear any fruit, though Kor's prototypes had at last begun to show promise. The ancient holy schemata in which he had placed his trust appeared to be valid after all, though it seemed now the time was sorely against the fulfillment of their promise. 
Worst of all, though, from the Archimagos' standpoint, were the disturbing rumors spreading from the Skyrim system. Certainly, deep space energistic augury suggested a fundamental disruption of cosmic forces had occurred, while reading of the Emperor's Tarot prophesied the dismaying corruption of chaos on every front. Belisarius' call did not yet possess enough sound intelligence to know precisely what had come to pass in the Skyrim system. Intuition told him, however, that it was nothing good. In one thing, Call was comforted, however. Mrs. had reached him promising that battle group Hephaestus had only to hold Stormforce Fortress together for a little longer. Reboot Gilliman was on his way at last, reputed to sail at the head of a truly formidable host drawn from the cream of Undomitus Crusade Fleet Primus. When Gilliman arrived, Call knew there would be a reckoning. It might have comforted the Archmagos to know that the Silent King had store of woes to equal Call's own. The Cesarak had a clearer view of matters was not a kindness. His hammer blow offensive intended to decisively reclaim momentum and control within the bounds of the nodal matrix had instead been calamitously disrupted. Cesarak had no answer for how such a tremendously powerful warp manifestation could have occurred in the presence of his pylons. Crucially, neither did Caesaras or any of the senior cryptics on whom the Silent King relied for answers. With his legion so shamefully routed in the Scaran system, Caesarek had been forced to divert reinforcements from his offensive against other war fronts to guard against this new threat. The humans could not know it, but they had only to weather his attacks a little longer and the Silent King would be forced to admit defeat and pivot to a more defensive strategy. Such a notion was infuriating, but it paled in comparison to the cold fury Cesarek felt for the actions of Imatek and now, if his agents were to be believed, Orican the Diviner or so. The Storm Lord, evidently perceiving the weakness of Cesarek's position, had launched fresh offensives on several key fronts. Worse, he now appeared to count Orican amongst his courtly advisers. What had driven the Chronomancer to such an alliance, Cesarek did not know, but it doubtless presaged storm clouds on the horizon.